And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the, na the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you got to say what? China. All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russian. Italian. Italy. German. German. Swedish. Korean, Korean, Egyptian, Egypt, Nigerian, Nigerian, Black. Black. Tell him, Pastor. Tell him, Pastor. Black, nothing. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. The lion won't sleep To sell our souls to barter profit Like God's property is hard to market So we steady to aim, keep your eyes on target Cause when you got to drive, yeah, they'd rather you park it But I don't valet, you ain't getting these keys I'm keeping closed hands, I'm on bending knee I'm just a reflection, dealing with eight sections Art mixed with life, you can feel the convection You lying, won't sleep The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black and the vernacular that we're supposed to have. When, when the school... You know, you know what you are? You are an ancient Israelite. Ancient Israelite, that's who we are. That's who we are. If you give me time, yeah. if you give me time, already said, uh, no, I know, we don't have so many years. I know, I know. Look, look at this. This is pages and pages of yeah. notes, and I promise we'll give yeah. more teaching. But here is my challenge to you. All right, I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites, or you want to be Jews? Do you want to remain ancient Israelites? Or you want to be Jews? The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. Today, it is prohibited, and you can Google this, to do a DNA test in Israel. Totally forbidden. Wrong. It's illegal. It's a crime. You'll be jailed if you do a DNA test in Israel. Why? Because they know the truth will come out. You come from Poland, you come from Ukraine, you came from Europe, you came from everywhere else. And they were the original Middle Eastern Jews who lived together with the Muslims and the Christians for centuries. For centuries. So what happened to a lot of the Jews? You might run into one of these groups of the Khazarians that would kill you after learning everything they could about you. They would steal your story. Then they would go to China, pretend to be you, make the deal, and then go back and the deal never happened. You might run into one of these groups of the Khazarians that would kill you after learning everything they could about you. They would steal your story. Then they would go to China, pretend to be you, make the deal, and then go back and the deal never happened. So, a little over a thousand years ago, as Jewish people scattered around the world had now emigrated in Europe and now were living in, in the Rhineland in Germany, they looked at the name Gomer in Genesis 10, and they connected Gomer with Germany, so they took on the identity of the name Ashkenaz. It has nothing to do with Ashkenaz in the Bible, which is a descendant of Yafet. It's just a name that was taken. Okay, it's that simple. Just like my last name, Brown, doesn't refer to the color of my skin or anything else. It was shortened from a, from a Russian name when, when my grandfather came over uh, at Ellis Island. The name got shortened to Brown. It's just 
a name. That's all it is. So the idea that Ashkenazi Jews are descended from Yafet is a myth, 100% false. Does having Jewish DNA determine your Jewish status? Great question. The answer is your Judaism is determined by your mother. If your mom's Jewish, you're Jewish according to traditional Judaism. Now you can have a very high count of Jewish DNA and that's awesome. That means you're connected to the Jewish people, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're Jewish. Don't forget, there are people that convert to Judaism and they have zero DNA and they're 100% Jewish. And you know what else, Jim? I just want to say this to our Christian friends, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just, to, just to call it as it is and say it straight out, you know, you guys are worshiping one Jew. That's a mistake. You should be worshiping every single one of us because we all die for your sins every single day. And that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. We're, we're all God's first born. We're dying for your sins right now because, because the Jewish people in the land of Israel are the bulwark mm -hmm. against the orcs. Mm -hmm. Okay, the orcs are coming not to a theater ne near you, but to your home. Stranger danger! Stranger danger! Stranger danger! Stranger danger! For the righteous, they, are, they exist in the world to come and they're rewarded. And for those whose major complexion is black, are excluded from the world to come. Major complexion is black, are excluded from the world to come. Major complexion is black, are excluded from the world to come. For the righteous, they, are, they exist in the world to come and they're rewarded. And for those whose major complexion is black, are excluded from the world to come. But the fact is that the clan here was not descended from uh, Shem through Judah, right? I mean, it's not descended from that line biblically. But the fact is that the clan here was not descended from uh, Shem through Judah, right? I mean, it's not descended from that line biblically. Uh, the entire Bible is about black people. Um, not only was Jesus black, but every character in the Bible seems to be black too. Yeah, Zephaniah and Jeremiah and Jebediah, those, those all aren't white people names, okay? Um, and Jesus wasn't some tan, partially melanated Middle Eastern person either. I'm talking straight up black dude, okay? Even in the book of Revelation, when you get the vision of Daniel, he's describing someone with feet like burnt brass and white woolly hair, and we've got the deep running water voice with the, the red eyes, and uh, you guys, he's black. The Jewish people are black people, like Kanye was right. Hi, Shalom Shalom from Israel. This is Ola, the daughter of Jethro. And I just heard that you black people that was stolen from Africa to America, that you don't know who you are. But you are the children of, of Yahweh, the children of Israel. And I'm telling you, you have to come back to your homeland, here to Zion, to Jerusalem because as the Gentiles, we do need you. We need you to come and pray because you are our saviors. You're the one that was chosen by Yahweh to live in this land, not the Jewish people, it's you. You were stolen from Africa, they deceived you, they told you that you are slaves, but you actually the children of Israel. And it's time just to come, come back. Come for, for your people, come back for us, come back for the whole Gentiles because only you. Why do you think that the U.S. is so quick to go help Israel fight against the Palestines? Why? They know that the Jewish people in Israel are not the original people. Oh, no, no, no. They are definitely not. The original people are black people and people of color. So why did one lady, Judith Shore, she was Israeli consul, say that the biggest threat in Israel is the younger, younger black community. What, why do they feel so threatened? Why, why? Because you know why? They know that the black people were the original chosen ones, the original ones that were there.
the people over there now, they took over all that land, just like they're trying to take over all of Palestine. They have taken so much land from Palestine also. But watch what this lady says about the black community being Israel's biggest problem. The black community being Israel's biggest problem. The black community. The major problem of Israel is with the young generation of the black community. Let's life matter starts there. I had last week a dinner, sit down dinner in my house with some of the people which are considered the leadership of the black community. I woke up, man, this morning with some disturbing news out of Israel. The Hamas kidnapping children, putting them in cages, killing women, killing the elderly. That's some cowards. It's, that's cowardly. And for all y'all Black Lives Matter who ain't saying nothing, well, let me figure out exactly what happened before I say anything. Oh, figure out what? It ain't never been cool to kidnap kids and put them in cages. It ain't never been cool to kill women and, and elderly. Never been. No matter where you from, what you represent, what tribe you for, it don't matter. There ain't never been no cool. There ain't never been nothing that nobody supported. And then you go and hide and put the kids in front of you as a barricade. That's some cowards. It's true. All you politicians who always have something to say on the contrary, I see you. Oh. All you Black Lives Matter people who always have something to say and always support everything else and you quiet now, it's oh. up to. Only place in the world where I can go and study tour and eat kosher food. Only place in the world. Only place in the world. Only place in the world. I don't know why we leaving Mouse's house. He been good to us. He feed us on Saturday, close us on Sunday, and then beat us on Monday. Or was it Tuesday? I was know. Jasper, I said, want to go out of the house again. Jasper, what? Jasper, don't you want freedom? We going to promised land. The promised land. The promised land. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10 explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. want to say peace and blessings to everyone. Hope and pray all of you guys are well. Uh, hope you guys had a great Shabbat. Uh, we had a great Shabbat on our end and uh, want to apologize to you guys uh, because of the technical difficulties earlier. Uh, we had some technical difficulties earlier on the uh, We Woke Now Extended. And for some of you guys that may not have a... Uh, a worship home a place to worship so to speak uh every shabbat we we actually uh stream our shabbat service and i didn't know that we were ha experiencing technical difficulties so what i'm going to do i'm going to uh we, we we did uh record the service right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh tomorrow i'll go over to the temple tomorrow and i will uh do some, um, you know, some um, editing to the video, and then I will upload it to our uh, uh, We Woke Now Extended. If you're not subscribed to the We Woke Now Extended channel, I encourage you guys to subscribe to that channel. Again, that's where we do a lot of our foundational teaching. That's where we do our, our Shabbat service over there. Uh, and we stream it for you guys, especially those that don't have a a uh, home place to worship. All right. So again, want to apologize to you guys for the technical difficulties. Also, um, we're planning on, of course, our Passover is coming up pretty soon um, in a couple of months. Our Pasach, if you guys, any of you guys that are, uh, you know, interested in uh, coming to our location to honor Passover, you know, to formally introduce ourselves, you know, we're going to have a great time. 
Uh, we always have a great time. So we want to actually have uh, Shabbat night service, and then we'll have uh, the very day, right? We'll be um, morning. We'll be honoring the Passover, Pasach, as well as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So uh, we'll be posting information for that uh, over, uh, to give you a heads up on that as well. So uh, what we're going to do tonight, you know, like we did uh, the last couple of lessons that I did, I wanted to do some foundational teaching. I wanted to use this as a a way to uh, or a means to encourage you guys, you know, and I want to still piggyback off of the uh, Daniel, right? Uh, the book, book of Daniel, chapter 10. We are uh, going into our third week of fasting. We began this fast two Shabbats ago. So uh, this Shabbat, we transitioned to our third week. All right, of the Shabbat. And lastly, before we get into the lesson, if you are subscribed to the channel, double check because uh, to make sure that you are still subscribed because you two uh, have been unsubscribing people without their knowing. And um, so they had to uh, subscribe again. So double check to ensure that YouTube is not doing that with you. You guys that have been following me, for a while, you guys already know what YouTube has uh, made efforts to suppress this channel, uh, suppress the numbers. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, getting back to where we were in terms of the bump. I want to say um, the past two months we have grown uh, over uh, added over to um, 10,000 subscribers over the past two months. Our goal was to hit 50,000 subscribers, but it was looking kind of bleak, you know, and then uh, I think, um, you know, around December, November, rather, uh, we were, I think, was at about 45, 46,000. And since then, we have, uh, you know, added almost 10,000 subscribers. So we know it's nothing but the most high. And I thank the most high for you guys. And like I say uh, to the people at our local assembly, had it not been for you guys, we would just be, uh, my wife and I, taking a walk by ourselves right and um and it's fulfilling a goal of, you know the actual goal of mine you know when we started pfr almost 15 minutes ago i mean 15 minutes 15 years ago uh, our goal was not to be a mega ministry you know a lot of pastors want to have the large uh congregation the assembly sitting before them that wasn't us when we started our ministry we started it in this house that you see here right our attic is where we used to host our our services and i mean we we had almost 100 people come into our home and many of the people were coming we didn't invite it was just the word of mouth and so they were uh you when i say they many of the locals were really pushing us to become like that 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 may that mega ministry of this area and i can tell you we had some uh some people that are very high up, you know, that are in their own spaces that was trying to push us, tried to get us to come up under their 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 leadership so they could put their name behind our ministry. And we turned them down. I'm talking about some very, uh, you know, people, prominent people in, in the Christian spaces that we turned down. And so for us and everyone that know me and I told them, I told them, I don't care about having a thousand people a thousand plus people that are sitting in our assembly you know creating a bottleneck i rather have you know a thousand plus people that have come through our ministry and then they can go to other areas and territories and then they can you know effect have an effect on a thousand areas at least a thousand different locations that's the that's what true evangelism is that's the goal of every ministry that we are uh, should be the goal that we're going out to reach to the four corners of this 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 globe right this earth this world and reaching all the israelites that scattered abroad you know and giving them this opportunity to uh to really embrace this truth right to have the option so i wanted to just lay that down and so this channel is just a reflection of that, that we're reaching places that we never thought we would reach by way of social media. So I thank the most high for you guys. 
thank the most high for the people who like my, my, my cousin, Pastor Jerry Carr, who's up in the Massachusetts area. I want to say thank you to uh, my cousin, uh, I, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Uh, Bishop Dr. William Brown with Boom Ministry, as well as my cousin, Benaya. And of course, can't forget about my sister, Carol, who actually was the one that got that stayed in my ear about starting this, uh, bringing the ministry over to YouTube because I was ready to give up on social media because of the things that um, Facebook were doing, suppressing my videos and all that other stuff. And so I really thank all of you as well over the years for the love and support. So with that being said, family, uh, this lesson that we want to get into tonight, right? Really want to use this as an opportunity to uh, explain Daniel, you know, because uh, we're doing our three week fast. We're now with third week of fasting. And so uh, the number three or the third letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bayat is the Gamal. And the Gamal means maturity, right? Maturity. I want to encourage you guys, if you're fasting, any of those, any of you that are fasting with us, I want to encourage you guys when you go into this third week, look at it. Uh, just uh, take a uh, self examination and see what are what are some of the areas in your life that you need to mature in, that you need to grow in. Doesn't matter how old you are, you know, because again, you know, we, it, it's it's all about uh, maturing, making sure that we do everything that the Most High has has called us to do. So if there's anything that you guys uh, need to improve on, guess what? You know, join us in this third week. Join us in this third week. You know, it's, we're doing a Daniel fast. Um, you know, the reason why it's called the Daniel fast is because of what he had done. Really didn't set out to go on a three week fast. Uh, he was going to fast until he got uh, received an answer for the most high. And we'll get to get into that in a second. So uh I want to encourage you guys, if you do, you know, again, uh, maturity is our theme for this week. Maturity, growth, you know, and and all of us have proven that you're never too old, you know, to, to, to learn. You're never too old to transition. You know, I mean, all of us, for the most part, have been in that system of Christianity and Catholicism. And so the Most High allowed us to make that transition out of that. So that's an example of never being too old to grow. You know, that old saying, can't teach a dog new tricks. Guess what? The Most High taught each and every one of us something new is that we don't need Christianity to have Christ. We don't need Catholicism to have Christ. We don't need these religious systems to validate who we are. Amen. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the lesson. Let me blow this uh, screen up here for you guys. And. Our lesson for tonight is Daniel saw the Negro Messiah. Let me say that again. Daniel saw the Negro Messiah. And I want to say this to you, family. We'll touch on it as we progress. Every time you look in that mirror, you make it a point. And even if you have to put it on a sticky note and put it on your mirror, put it inside your Bible, put it on your desk at work, write on it. There's something special about you, Judah. There's something special about you, Israel, right? There's something special about you, Judah. Christianity knows this, which is a daughter of Catholicism. They know this. Judaism know this. All of them know exactly who we are. They know just how powerful we are through the most high. They know that we are the chosen people of the most high. So remind yourself, there's something special about you, Judah. Whenever you look in the mirror, remember there is something special about you. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's impossible. When you say that, when you make that type of declaration to yourself in the mirror, it's hard to look mean. It's hard to look mean when you're giving yourself such a compliment as that. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and get into it, family. 
Daniel saw the Negro Messiah. And I put a sub thought here for you. He touched me. And we'll 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 touch on that in a second. But I want to start this off here, you know, to just really knock down some strongholds, you know, because when you understand strongholds from a biblical perspective, they are conversations, doctrines that have been created off of conversation. Let me say that again. Strongholds are what doctrines that started off that were uh, that that branched off of conversations. All right. Uh, appreciated uh, David uh, Taylor. Our services, we normally start streaming at 1230. We have things going on prior to, but normally I take the floor at 1230. And so we, we, we try to capture just me being on the floor. I don't believe in broadcasting altar calls. So we just have our service as far as me being on the floor. Sometimes I'll show our worship, uh, but uh, it's strictly the message. And again, I don't believe in broadcasting altar calls that is intimate, that is private, that is personal. And I don't use altar call to try to broadcast or take pictures. Never, never got caught up in those things. So it's not about trying to pump me up or make me uh, look like or uh, a certain way. You know, I, I am a brother just like everyone else. All right. I am. I am seeking the father just like everyone else. So I uh, just thought I'd put that out there. So the lesson, I mean, the service is strictly the sermon, you know, strictly the message. Again, we don't deal with all that other stuff. You know, Christianity, many churches, when they put up websites and all that, they want to capture the altar call to give this impression that it's all about the leader and they're, they're, they're tearing down walls, which they, they are actually building up strongholds. All right. But anyway, I uh, appreciate you for asking the question. Hallelujah. So I want to start this. I want to preface this lesson with Exodus chapter 20, verse three through seven. All right. And before I do this, let me make sure that I can post right now. Let me log into my YouTube channel. Because I want to make sure I'm able, I am able to post uh, a Q, uh, uh, a poll. All right, so let me just make sure I'm logged in and that way I can get uh, put a poll out there here in a second. All right, yep, I wasn't logged in. So let me do it right now. All right, I'll say it again. If you are subscribed to the channel, right, double check to make sure you're still subscribed to the channel. And if you're brand new to the channel, make sure you hit that notification button. Let's keep this momentum going. Hallelujah. We've been doubling every year. So uh, I know that goal. It may sound like it's uh, a really high goal, but hey, the most high, everything is possible. So we didn't hit that 50,000 mark. Let's let's uh, let's our goal is to hit that uh, that century mark. Right. That 100,000. Hallelujah. And if we keep up on this pace, we'll definitely be close, if not exceeding that. All right. But anyway. So let's go ahead and get into it. Exodus chapter 20. Right. Verse three through five. All right. I want you to open your Bibles up to Exodus chapter 20, verse three, verses three through five. And I'm going to I'm going somewhere with this uh, this passage here because we're going to knock down people, uh, people within this community as well as in the church that can be very dogmatic with uh what they uh their thoughts their uh their impressions and what they believe that the scriptures are actually saying and what i mean by dog dogmatic they can be stuck on things that they don't want to let go teachings that started within the church within christianity and they brought many of that uh, many of those beliefs over to this awakening and they don't want to let it go. So this is going to be an example of that. This, this uh, passage that I'm going to cover to kind of set up the le overall lesson. Uh, so let's go to Exodus chapter 20. All right. And we're going to start at verse three. Again, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. And we're, we're going to, going to uh, start at verse three. 
All right. And it reads. Thou shall have no other Allahayim before me. Thou shall not make any graven. Excuse me. Thou shall make thou not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Let me read it again. These are the first two commandments. Thou shalt have no other Allah before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or water under the earth. All right. In the water under the earth. Verse five. Thou shalt not bow down. Shafak thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, Allahayim, am a jealous Allahayim. Let me say that again. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, Allahayim, am a jealous Allahayim. Visiting the iniquity, in other words, iniquity, uh, shall, uh, uh, this, this word means, right, in the Greek, Right. This uh, word means uh, which is anomia, which means bending, twisting, uh, distorting the law, statutes and commandments. The word of Yah and the Greek, I mean, in the uh, ancient Hebrew, Shawab, it means the same thing. So visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me for uh, so. What is the proper context of this commandment? Right. What is the proper context of this commandment? I'll read it one more time just so that way we can uh, build on this. All right. Let me read it one more time. What is the proper context of this text? Thou shalt have no other Allah before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5 Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh Allahayim, am a jealous Allahayim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth of them, or generation of them that hate me. All right, so what is this text saying? What is the proper context? Because this is one of those passages that many toss around. This is one of those passages that many toss around and they, they, they toss it around uh, to bully people, to discourage people, to undermine people. So we're going to give proper clarity, the proper context of this passage. Right. So let's uh, go to Exodus uh, the same chapter, verse one and two. I purposely started at verse three for a reason. But let's put this passage, uh, these two commandments, first two commandments and its proper context. All right. So. It says here and Allah Hayyam spake all these words, saying, I am. Yahweh or the Yahweh, thy Allah Hayyam. Actually, the the, the ha doesn't even need to be there. Because it's not even in the ancient Hebrew. And that word thy doesn't need to be there because that's not in the ancient Hebrew. It'll read Yahweh Allahayim. But to make it uh you know easier for you to read, this is why you see these th these two filling words here. But in Allahayim spake all these words saying, I am Yahweh Allahayim. Yahweh thy Allahayim. Yours will say or transliterate to. Uh, the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So I want you guys to make sure you circle Egypt. Because when you understand these first two commandments, right, Egypt is going to be the example because Israel came out of Egypt. 
And while Israel was in Egypt, they picked up a lot of bad habits. They picked up a lot of bad habits, just like being in the land of captivity, what we're doing here in this country, this United States. Israel have, you know, we really have picked up a lot of bad habits. We have literally picked up a lot of behaviors uh, that the oppressors have. Or should I say picked up a lot of uh, poor behaviors of the oppressors, the people that have kidnapped us, raped our community, uh, murdered so many of our ancestors, and scattered us to the four corners of this globe, uh, enslaved us, family. So many, is, many of our people, many of us have picked up some bad habits, habits and behaviors of the oppressor. So circle Egypt inside your uh, your Bible. All right. I'm going somewhere with this. So. Israel. Right. Or. An example that I want to give you. Of Israel holding on to the deities of Kemet, right? Kamat, right? And uh, the reason why I'm going to start saying Kamat versus Egypt is even though, right, our bloodline is Israel, right? Kemet is not our a bloodline, but I want to make sure we're not indirectly playing into the hands of the people that have been hijacking everyone's identity. You know, these name stealers, right? I want to make sure we're not, at least on this platform, we're not uh, basically indirectly carrying out their agenda because that, that, that Egypt, right? Mitzrayim or whatever, that was not the original name of, uh, of uh, that the people there, <coughs> excuse me, you know, it was Kamat, right? Kamat. Some would say Kemet. All right. So I'm going to make it a point to start using certain words, just like in this awakening. We don't want anyone to call us anything outside of being Israel. And if you're part of the tribe of Judah, the southern king, kingdom of Judah, then Judah. But we don't want to be called, you know, certain labels that they have placed on us. And so by us uh, using those those words like the word Jew and Jewish, we still indirectly push their agenda. We still allow them to be in our space. That word was not created for anything but deception for political purposes. So we don't want to be called uh, those names. And we say that we are Israelites. We are Judah, right? I'm going to do the same thing when it comes to identifying some of these other countries, these other countries that's within the scriptures. We're not going to do their work for them indirectly. So if you see me start referring to them as Kemet, is for this is the reason, right? They're hijacking everything. But it, here's an example of Israel holding on to the deities of Kemet. Here's an example here. When we go to Exodus 32, starting at verse two, this is going to give you more of a proper understanding of the first two commandments. But I still have to bring it home as we get ready to get into the main uh, meat of the, the lesson for tonight. So let's start at verse two. Let's see what it says. Exodus chapter 32, starting at verse two. And, and Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the, the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. All right. Understand this, right? Moses is taking longer than what they anticipated. He's up with the most high. Joshua didn't go all the way up with them, but Joshua is at a distance from what's going on down here among the people. 
So Israel is getting restless. They are getting uh, impatient and waiting for Moses to return. So in all the people, right, they, they, be, they decided that they were going to create their own Allahayim, their own deity, right? They decided that they were going to, uh, you know, hold on to Egypt, so to speak, or actually Kemet, so to speak. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. Verse four, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf, right? A goat demon. So here it is. They brought all their gold, the very thing that the Most High had given them, reparations. They took their reparations and decided to use it for idol worshiping. They decided to the very place that the Most High delivered them from. They wanted to build the deities of where they came from. So this tells you that Israel, right, they they were indulging in behaviors they that they should not have been indulging in. They were embracing, many of them were embracing the deities of Egypt. So after he had made it a molten calf and they said, these be thy Allah right? They, they declared that this is going to be their Allah O Israel, which brought thee out, uh, up out of the land of Egypt. So now they're giving the most high credit to the Egyptians. This handmade idol, they began to worship the idols of Kemet, starting with this goat demon. Right? So, family, putting this, we're going to put Exodus 20 in this proper context. So, here it is Israel, they're not in Egypt. So, now they're worshiping, they built an idol of the Egyptian deities, right? And that, and now they're giving that deity the credit for delivering them out of Kemet, Hamad. Verse 5, and when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it. Now you have the high priest, the future high priest, who was indulging, who actually put together the goat demon. And Aaron made a prop Proclamation on this at this moment at the height of you know this 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 worship, Aaron decided that they that he declared the very next day is going to be a feast day. It's going to be a Shabbat. It's going to be a feast day, paying homage to this goat demon that they created. Come on, family. You know we the people of the book. You know, we the people of the book. So they came out, Mosai delivered them out of Kemet. Now the e Israelites, impatient, now they, the very place that they delivered them from, their mind still wasn't fully <laughs> sold out. They were still kind of like holding on as I kind of use it. And you guys know where I'm going at. Many of us made it out of the projects, but still holding on to a project mindset. They're still holding on to the mindset of their oppressors. And that's what we see happening in this awakening. Many have come out of the church, come out of Christianity, come out of Catholicism. Some have come out of Judaism, come into this awakening, but they still haven't let go of the mindset and how they approach things. So Aaron made a proclamation among all of the Israelites and said, this is supposed to be Moses' right-hand man, his brother, and said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. So Aaron created a feast day, and they rose up early on the morning, or excuse me, on the morrow, and offered burnt offerings. So they're doing sacrifices, sin offerings, repentance offerings. So they built an idol, and now they're repenting to this deity that they created repenting for following who the most high now they're repenting to this idol denouncing the father now they, they they're creating burnt offerings for that deity that they created i hope y'all see the blasphemy this is blasphemy family 
and brought peace offerings. You see what they're doing? They took everything that's supposed to be allocated for the most high. They redirected it over to this goat demon. And now they have a feast day. They created a feast day to this goat demon. They, they gave credit to this goat demon. They actually creating their own Passover because they gave the goat demon the credit for delivering them. So now they're creating a Passover for this goat demon in, in honor of this goat demon, a feast day. So it says they rose up early on the mor um, tomorrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In other words, carnival. This is carnival right here. They're having carnival. That's right. This is carnival. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you guys uh, that are from the uh, Caribbean, uh, uh, some of you guys that are living in certain areas that they have carnival. Y'all know what this said, what, what this is right here. This is carnival. It says they rose up early uh, on the morrow and often burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat, to drink and rose up to play. So that goat demon was placed on a, what is called a movable altar, which is a float. So in these parades, especially in carnival, this is where you see those movable, those movable floats. Those movable floats are actually altars. And that's what Israel began to indulge in. Right. They're having their Mardi Gras celebration right here. Letting us farewell to the flesh, so to speak. All right. So is having and this is why I want to go here with this, because they rose up, they created idols here. So now I want to shift this thought over to is he having cherubims on the lid of the ark a contradiction to the first two commandments? Because the first two commandments made it clear. Told us not to make idols or anything like that. But then it went on to say, don't make images of graven images that's the key graven images of things that that are in heaven things that that are in or under the earth and things that are in the water so israel was told not to make any graven images so is having the cherubim on the lid of the ark a contradiction <laughs> right let me let me type that in here because i know i just threw you a monkey wrench here i know you guys like Wait a minute, Pastor, where are you going at with this? And I'm going somewhere with this because we got to break these strongholds. We got to break these devices that Christianity and Catholicism uh, began to push and create. So that way we start self-checking one. Another. So let me go ahead and put this in the chat. And um, I encourage you guys to post your thoughts here as well as participate in the poll. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Lid of the ark. All right. I'm going to post this question here. And I'm going to add an option here for you guys here. Let's add it here. All right. I'm going to start this poll. All right. So if you don't know, that's what that not sure option is. If you believe that this is a contradiction, type one or click one. If not, two. All right. So is this a contradiction? And feel free to post your thoughts of why you feel like this is not a contradiction. But guess what, family? I have an X here for a reason. But is this a contradiction from because we were told not to make any idols, any graven images of anything that's of heaven, of the heavens. And we know that cherubims, they guess what? They are the heavens. All right. So far. Let's look at the numbers and let's see if we can get at least 100 participants in this poll. Right now we are at 57 votes. You know, we have almost 600 people inside the chat. 
So let's see if we can get at least 100 participants in this poll. So far, we have 66% said no, 14% says yes, and 22% not sure. And again, you know, uh, right now, this is not a right or wrong answer because I'm going to explain it. So let's go to see who uh, some, some of the responses here. All right. Let's see here. Let's see. Let's see if I could go up a little bit. All right. Yasharala, let's see here. Uh, it's not against. It's because the Most High gave the instructions on how to build the cherubim. Definitely understand your point. But the question is, is it a contradiction? Is the Most High telling Israel, do as I say, not as I do? Right. So we're going to give clarity, but I really appreciate the um, the, the response. Uh, Nora Bain holding things down up in Pennsylvania. Uh, know Yahweh commanded. We're going to give we're going to give clarity. All right. But great answers. Let's see here. Wasn't it Yahweh who gave instructions to put them there? Right. Someone posted here. Chur, chur, um, cherub is real thing or chur, um, tribune. Right. Uh, cherubim, excuse me, uh, is is real thing. Someone asking the question. Uh, not sure. Uh, got me mis mispronouncing the word here. But cherubim, all right. So, going to give clarity on here. Shout outs to Octeria. Uh, thank you for the love and support over the years. Uh, but Yasharala uh, said no. Nora Bain said no. Tori Love said no. My sister Carol been holding it down. Said no. All right. Uh, let's see here. For some reason, these are not displayed on time. The chat is kind of slow. Rocky Balboa said no with the two. Let's see who else. EVA or Eva rather said uh, two. So far, I'm seeing most of you guys are saying no. Hebrew and you two. Uh, let's see here. James Kelly two. Uh, S O Y Soy uh, two. And uh, post the um the what the acronym stands for because I I don't want to disrespect you by saying S O Y or Soy. If there's a uh, acronym, you know, because I see the dot, so I'll, that's an acronym for something. If you want to just post it in the comment section, I want to make sure I be respectful to uh, your 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 name. All right. So let's see here. Someone else says it's an it's instructions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Masana uh, Masanama. It is written, though thou shalt not, shall not make anything in the heaven all right appreciate the the response let's see who else we have here let's see here uh uh ama in the building holding it down in california say yah told solomon how to build the tabernacle didn't he have uh cherubim all right so we're gonna give clarity you guys give us some great answers uh let's see what else we have here not sure uh laronda not sure so we're going to give clarity on that that's hey it's all right i'm gonna give clarity uh yaz humble garden not sure let's see here shamara uh said nope all right let's see here a couple more and then we'll go ahead and answer this question let's see here uh nanya said the bible does not contradict if cherubims are wrong then the whole Bible has to be checked out. Cherubim, cherubim must also be of the earth. All right, a couple more before we give the answer. They bolt, they bolt it to Yah's, uh, built it to Yah's specification, did they not? Well, we're gonna give it, we're gonna give clarity because yeah, they the most high gave them the command. But I want to give you clarity because this is one of those passages that many would use uh and not use it in the proper context. All right. So let's go to I'll give the answer here as we get ready to get into the main lesson. Right. What is the proper context? <laughs> what is the proper context? What is the proper context? Because if we go to Exodus 25, starting at verse 21, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark and in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet thee. 
or excuse me, meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat and be, uh, from between the two cherubims. So we see two cherubims that are on the lid, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. All right, so is this, and I'm going to go here in a second, is this a contradiction? And I'm going to tell you, absolutely not. This is not a contradiction. You guys are correct. This is not a contradiction. Why? Why? Because number one, they are not worshiping. It's not just the fact that the Most High gave them instructions, but they are not worshiping the cherubim. They're there based upon instructions of the Most High. Let me say that again. See, we've been so conditioned to, and, 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 and we see this happening around us, right? People taking the scripture to bully people not to doing certain things. See, just like 99%, most of you guys, let me see here. Let me see the percentage here, right? 60% posted or what in the uh, in the vote said uh, it's not a contradiction. 10% 10 10 said it is. 30% said they're not sure. So the majority of you said that this is not a contradiction, which it's not. But this is where we have to understand the two, the first two commandments. In its proper context, this is why I took you to uh, read and see exactly what Israel had done by building the golden calf, right? In Exodus 28, that is an example of idol worshiping. So many have used uh, these commandments, especially in the church, right? These, these holy rollers, right? When that movie, uh, the book of Clarence came out. That's what many began to run with. Suggesting that if you go to a movie and watch biblical characters being depicted in the movie, that you are participating in idol worshiping. Not a single person is going to the movie and have come out, not just that movie and other movies, have come out worshiping the actors as if they are actually the people the characters, they are what is called role playing. Now they're making it so that way, trying to tell you that if you have ro if you role play any of the characters in scripture, starting with the Messiah, if you have any skits because you know that this is how we teach our children. Then you are committing or breaking these first two commandments. Now, have you guys gone to any of these movies, any movies or saw any movies, even the movies that back in the day when you was watching uh, some of these biblical movies that was whitewashed? When you watched that movie, did you come out of watching that movie on uh, on DVD, whatever you had and say that you're worshiping the actual character? No. No. You're not worshiping by going to watch a movie you're not in cahoots with anyone by watching a movie or watching a skit or putting together a skit to what of the scriptures that's the point that i'm making here that's what this scripture is actually telling us you are not idolizing someone you're not creating idols because you went to a movie and you saw a an actual what play or an actual portrayal of the people and I'm going to further explain this. I'm going to give you proper context. See, we have to let this stuff go. Because many was screaming out blasphemy. Blasphemy or what? You blasphemy a character in the movie that is highlighted to being a false prophet in the movie. And you saying this what? Blasphemy the false prophet? Carrie Wright. That, that's not the question. That's besides the point. Yes, yeah, some people do worship people. That's not the same, you know, that's not the same in the context. Many people do idolize the people. But are you idolizing 
creating idols when you go to the movies and you or you watch a movie you don't have to go to the movies purchase a video of someone portraying the messiah have you have you have you watched the movie and say you know that's the messiah regardless of if they look like us you never watch someone portraying saying that's the messiah so the key <laughs> I want to make sure you guys understand that, understand this. And I'm not just I'm just using that movie for an example. Right. The key is what's in your mind. <laughs> Let me say this again. See, the idol, if we're not careful, we can make an idol into our skin complexion. Let me say that again. Not watching some character. Some people play a, a role. And you're not serving them either. So just like we just explained, you guys agreed, the cherubim, guess what? That's not breaking the commandments because you are not worshiping the cherubim. You're not going to the movies to worship anyone. You're going there because guess what? You're feeling good to say, hey, let's see what this movie about. You know, just like the Blair Underwood movie that our own brothers and sisters undermined. He is a Christian, created a movie 30 years ago because he wanted to have our people to have set in their minds seeing an uh, a image of what more of an accurate depiction of the of, of the Messiah and all the people there. But he got shot down because our own community did not support him, got into heated discussions. They swift voted the movie. And all he did was try to show our people that we are the people of the book. And we decided to take the Christian, uh, the Catholic approach of lynching our own brothers and sisters, demonizing them. And I'm going to give you another example of the proper context of what it means. Here it is. Let's go to Maccabees. I know I didn't get into my lesson yet, but I want to set the tone here. Let's go to first Maccabees starting at chapter three. And we're going to highlight verse 47. And I'm going to prove something here. We're going to prove something here. Right. It says here, then they fasted that day, put on sackcloth and ashes or cash ashes upon their heads rent their clothes and laid open the book of the law so they're opening up torah they're opening up the law right with you know the law the first five books but they're opening up they made sure they open up the road of the most high's law statutes and commandments the instructions of the most high wherein the heathen has sought to paint the likeness of their images see family we have to make sure that we're not just looking at this from them taking a paintbrush. See, how do you paint an image? That's so much for them to try to paint images into roles. It's what in your mind to paint their images in your mind on how you view the text. That's why so many of our brothers and sisters are under a strong delusion, because no matter how much truth you give them, they're going to still paint in their mind the images that are stored in it of seeing a Caucasian Messiah, to see a Caucasian Israelites, to see Caucasian Egyptians or Kemet, to see Caucasian Ethiopians. They want everything to be whitewashed. So the Greeks, their whole mindset was what? Changing how you interpret, how you view the scriptures. They wanted the Israelites to start viewing the scriptures, viewing the law, statutes and commandments of the most high from a Greek perspective and mesh it with their deities. They wanted Israel to what? Take on the uh, look at Jerusalem no longer as being that the holy place of the most high to being Mount Olympus. So this is what we have to understand, family. It's more. It's more to the commandments than what we have been uh, walking around trying to put people in bondage of. Come on, family. Come on, family. Now, I'm not saying some people are worshiping idols or making idols out of people. Absolutely. But how many of you guys went to a movie and out of that movie, 
you said you're going to worship that character now because that's that's it. No, come on, family. That's not what we're supposed to do. That's not what the text means. It means that you're creating idols, you're creating images, and you're worshiping it. If that's the case, everyone that wears the symbol of the lion, right? The lion, that's an idol, right? Anyone that has uh, the tetragram, the um, tetragram, uh, you know, or uh, tetragrammaton on their hats with Yahweh or YHWH on your hat, you are using the Most High's name in vain. Come on, family, if we want to go there, you see how now we start placing so many uh, uh, strongholds on people. See, you're not worshiping the people. The first thing we all we've been asking as a community, when are we going to start seeing movies? That's a reflection of us. And whenever there's a movie that's a reflection of us, Blair Underwood was the first one to make a movie that depicted the whole crucifixion with melanated people. He was the first one to do that. And our own community shot him down. He got more, more support from the other communities than our own people. So I wanted to use that as an opportunity to lay the foundation. Because just because you don't have images, graven images, guess what? Many of us cannot let go of that Caucasian skin, <laughs> right? Many of us can't let go of that Caucasian skin. Many of us can't let go of that Caucasian appearance. Many of us cannot let go Caesar Bourget, right? And I'm going to give a little spoil alert here real quick. When you watch the movie, if you, have, if you guys have seen it, see... <laughs> matter of fact i'm not gonna do it i ain't gonna i, I don't want to hijack the, the the teaching tonight we'll deal with it another time i'm not gonna read this but this is josephus lang uh testifying wrote about how the romans right the greeks how they were hijacking people's identities this is what this is saying so i'm not gonna read all of this for the sake of time all right so now let's transition into our main lesson that was just the introduction I know y'all like, man, that was a long introduction, but I just wanted to lay out the foundation to make sure that we are all on the same page. Let's let's stop putting strongholds on our brothers and sisters. Let's start having arguments, unfruitful arguments that can cause people to be lost. Come on, family. And we can we the very things that the most high uh, or, or Yahweh shy uh spoke on and had to address with the pharisees we cannot and we can indirectly start pushing the same behavior all right so now this is where we start getting into idols right this is where you can start getting to idol worshiping and i'm going to deal with this caesar bourget and uh coming up so let's go and get into it right I want to ask this question here. Or actually, I want to make this declaration. Good things happen on the Shabbat. Let me say that again. Good things happen on the Shabbat. Contrary to what the church have taught you, contrary to what Christianity, Catholicism have taught you, good things happened on the Shabbat, right? Great signs occurred on the Shabbat. Great signs are revealed on the Shabbat. I'm going to prove that to you. Let's start with Daniel chapter 10. Right. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. We're going to start at verse one and we want to now we get into the actual lesson. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was made plain to Daniel. So this is making it clear. Uh, uh, you know, that, you know, Daniel understood the message. So it wasn't from a perspective of that. Daniel went into this fast. Of of seeking the most high to get a clear message of what the vision he revealed to him. So it says a message was made plain to Daniel. When Daniel actually was fasting was for the people, the Israelites, you know, an unexpected threat, right? And how to what deal with that situation. 
So a message was made plain to Daniel, whose Babylonian name was Belshazzar. The message was true. It dealt with a big war. He understood the message, the understanding coming by revelation. In those days, Daniel, I in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning about three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all. In other words, he bathed, but he didn't put lotion on, so to speak. So Daniel was ashy. All right. Y'all know how we do. Y'all know how our skin gets. If we don't put any any balm or lotion or anything on our skin, guess what? You guys know what happened. We will be some ashy people. Y'all know, y'all know it's real. Y'all, y'all know I'm speaking the truth on that. All right. So I went on to close out the the poll so that way I can post um, others as we progress in this lesson. All right. Let me see here. All right. So. All right. It says here, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and 20th day of the first month, right, I was by the side of the great river. Now, I want you guys to understand this. When Daniel went on his fast, it was after the Passover, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread celebration. Because it says here on the 24th day of the first month, right, because uh, the 15th, the 14th actually is the Passover, Pasach. The 15th is the Feast of Unleavened Bread of the other first month. And that's a uh, pretty much an eight day celebration. Right. So after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Daniel went on his fast. But it says, and in the fourth and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hidekel or Hidekel, however you want to pronounce it. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphas. All right. His body was also like the burrow and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass. And actually it's not brass. It should be bronze or copper. Not brass, brass, the metal didn't even exist back at that time. Right? Not kasha. And the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quakening fell upon them. So they may not have saw the seen the vision, but they felt that movement. He felt the ground shake. So they fled to hide themselves. And family, I want to say this as a word of encouragement to you guys. Right. Don't get discouraged because it can be draining when you're dealing with family members that you express to them that you know who you are. You know that you express to them that you're going to honor the feast days, that you express to them that you are no longer going to honor or celebrate these pagan holidays that you're going to honor the Shabbat. It can be very draining when the very people you thought was going to embrace you began to demonize you. The same people that you thought was going to love up on you because you're giving them some deeper revelation on what they have understood and approached the text. Instead, they began to ridicule you. I'm talking about family members, you know, I mean, uh, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, even ministries that you have helped build with your own hands. And because you share with them, you know who you are. All of a sudden, they began to separate themselves from you. They began to talk about you, but they embraced the drug dealer. They embraced that preacher that had babies all up in that ministry. They embraced that homosexual preacher. They embraced all these different things, but you who is making an assertive effort to honor the law, statutes, and commandments, they will rather embrace a murderer before they embrace you. They will rather embrace anything but 
the Negroes who really understand who they are. And I'm sure every last one of you have gone through this. And so, you know, they, you know, even they know in their heart that you are telling the truth. But I want to encourage you guys. I want to encourage you guys. Sometimes it's going to feel as if you're the only one that see the truth. The others can't see it, but they can feel a movement. They see what's going on. And guess what? Out of fear, they flee. They go hide themselves. So Daniel says, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quakening fell upon them. Right. So they were shook. They were shook. They knew something was going on. They couldn't see the vision, but they felt it. Let me say that again. You know, just because someone can't see the vision can cannot see or understand what you're saying or purposely want to be disagreeable. But they still feel that power. They still feel that truth. Come on, family. All right. Verse eight. Therefore, I was left alone. Right. They departed. And saw this great vision. Sometimes the most high have to put you through situations, family. Like flour. Use that sift to sift people out, to sift things out so that way he can anoint what's remaining. So don't be discouraged when family members, friends want to separate themselves from you because you are doing exactly what the most high command us to do that's honoring his law statutes and commandments don't be discouraged family therefore i was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me come on family how many of you guys have lost your strength you know you're trying to express you're trying to give the truth to your brothers and sisters your loved ones and man they just ex they just literally exhausted all of you you have no fight in you you have become just like daniel chapter 7 uh I believe verse 24 uh, warns about about how that fourth beast, right, that beast that is good with manipulating things, that that diverse beast that's good with manipulating and taking others identities. These uh the name stealers, so to speak, you know, they have put so much them, you know, wore you out. And what what, what it means is when you see wear out the holy people of Yah, it means to make you good for nothing. And I think all of you guys know where I'm going at with this. I know you guys have come home from work before. And as soon as you got home, you worked, you, you had to deal with all kinds of challenges at work. And by the time you got home, guess what? You had nothing in you. You were good for nothing. You know, you know, you're supposed to cook. You, you you have nothing in you to cook. You know, you're supposed to do certain cleanings. You have nothing. I mean, you're not good for nothing. You have no strength in you. You you, you know, your children want to play with you, but you have no strength to play. Your, your wife or your spouse want to love up on you, but you just don't have it in you. Some of you probably before you even go in the house, you sit in your car for an extra five to 10 minutes just to sit and try to, uh, uh, you know, regather yourself in the car because you have to deal with so much. See, that's what it means where it says that the enemy wants to wear us out, wear us out. In other words, make us good for nothing. So here was Daniel in this fast. And he's making it clear that when he was going through this fast, guess what? His temperament began to change, how he responded to people, which what was changing, because he said here for my comeliness was turned, turned in me into corruption and and I retain no strength. See, when the Most High gives you a vision and you begin to seek him, you know, I'm sure you guys have prayed, went into that prayer closet, went into that prayer room in your house, whether, whether it's um, your bedroom, whether it's the closet within your house, whether it's the family room, whether it's the dining room, you have gotten into a place that you said, you know what, I'm going to pour out my myself to the Most High. And in the process, you had nothing left and you, you had no strength in you. So when you're going through a fast, 
fast. Guess what? When you go through a fast, your flesh is really warring against your spirit. Your flesh really wants to eat certain things. See, you detoxing your flesh. You know, the biggest drug that the United States have gotten our people on is not marijuana. It's not crack. It's not heroin. It's not uh, taking these different pills and all that. That's not the drug. The biggest drug that this country have gotten our people addicted to is sugar. That's right. We are so addicted to sugar. So now with that sugar, it has an effect on your body. Your sugar can mess with your blood pressure. That sugar can give you all kinds of heart conditions. That sugar can cause all kinds of what? Can cause diabetes. Sugar can cause all kinds of problems within your digestive system. Sugar can mess up your teeth. Sugar can mess up your gums. Sugar can do so much to your body. They have our people, guess what? Addicted to sugar. They don't, sh they're shutting down all the supermarkets that you can get uh, fresh foods from. Guess what? They're going to that, uh, that fresh vegetables or whatever the case may be. They shutting these things down and discouraging the farmer's markets. And now they're planting up these, planting these family dollars. They planting these dollar generals. So you go in there, many of our brothers and sisters that are lacking, that don't have the transportation to go out further to get healthy foods. What are they doing? They getting pot, uh, stuff that is condensed that have all kinds of sugar in it. Have you ever tasted, truly tasted and eaten frosted flakes? I'm not talking about the uh, frosted flakes by, um, what's that? I can't even think of the name of the company. But the Frosted Flakes, I'm talking about the Frosted Flakes, the true wheat flakes with the natural sugar. Have you ever tasted natural cereal? Come on, family. I, I, I remember I went to a, a, a bed and breakfast, took my wife there uh, a couple of months ago. Man, they had fresh cereal. Not Kellogg's. That's right. Not uh, any of those different brands that are out there. I'm talking about fresh. I literally, we had uh, fresh cornflakes. We had fresh, I mean, totally, it was night and day. Night and day. You got, when you eat truly real frosted flakes versus uh, Kellogg's, you'll see it's night and day. When you eat truly eat raisin brand, I'm not talking about from, from post and all of that. I'm talking about the true it's night and day, family. Night and day. But when you go through this fast, right, and you start denying your body these sugars, your body continues to war with you. And you can become weak. You can become uh, worn out. But as the Messiah said, Hamashiach said, endure what? Hardship. As a good soldier, endure family. Those that endure to the end will be saved. Come on, family. So therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. So Daniel saying, hey, you know what? My body is going through change. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When you fasting, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you truly understand, if you guys actually went on a, an extensive fast, a lengthy fast, Guess what? When you when, when you turn down and no longer put meats inside your system, when you don't put these sugars inside your body, I don't drink so, soda and I don't eat a lot of sweets and all that stuff. You know, I rarely eat sweets. I don't get it all, get all into the processed foods. The only meats that we eat is lamb and we go, you know, we go out and pick it. You know, we don't go out here and eat, eating any and everything. Right. So. But guess what? When you go on these type of fasts and you're just doing water and you're doing fruits you're doing vegetables you know we don't even try to look for any substitutes we just doing fruits and we're doing vegetables we eat one time a day guess what that can make your vibe your body start feeling a certain way that's why you know when i'm at work and i have a business meeting that i have to attend to i'll take an orange slice and put it inside my mouth just to make sure my breath is not kicking <laughs> y'all know what i'm talking about because when you're fasting your personal hygiene begin to shift right you're you know because if you understand you know bad breath bad breath doesn't come from your mouth it comes from your belly let me say that again <laughs> bad breath doesn't come from your mouth bad breath comes from your belly it comes from your stomach 
It comes from your stomach out of the abundance of the house. I mean, the heart, the mouth speak. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles you. It was it's what comes out of your mouth. And that is that passage is not telling you to go out and eat unclean foods that is dealing with washing with clean hands. Bad breath comes from the stomach, not from your mouth. So with that being said, when you're going through a fast, your mood can change a little bit. You know what I mean? You know, because your your hygiene is not where it's where, where you want it to be. Your energy level began to decrease. So that's what Daniel is describing here. So Daniel had an amazing vision, an encounter with uh, Yahweh Shai, the son of the most high. Right. Daniel was side by uh, by the side of um, the Hideko uh, or Tigris River when he suddenly saw someone who was more majestic. You know, he saw the Messiah and awesome than any person he had ever seen. Though he was speechless at the time, Daniel would never forget what the man looked like, right? So who did Daniel see? See, Daniel saw someone that he didn't anticipate seeing. Come on, family. Who did he see? Who did Daniel see? His clothing was linen. His belt was made of the purest gold. His body looked like a, a dazzling gem that reflected bright colors. His face was as bright as flashes of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. No, it wasn't because he was drinking a lot of wine like some teach. No, he was not drunk. But that's describing the intensity. His arms and legs gleamed like polished bronze. His voice thundered like the roar of a multitude. And if you guys understand Phineas, I didn't put the text in here for the sake of time. Read Numbers chapter 25. Study Phineas. Phineas name actually means Phineas, the Negro mouth of brass. In other words, that brass means authority. So this is describing the voice, the authority, the Negro, the, that power behind this Negro. Right. Whenever he speaks. So the voice thundered like the roar of a multitude. So he heard the voice of Hamashiach. So did Daniel, well, actually, I'm going to say this, right? I asked the question, did Daniel see this Messiah on your, screen, on your screen? Did Daniel see a Messiah that looked like what you see on the screen, <laughs> right? If you believe that Daniel saw someone resembling this guy right here, type one, if you believe that he didn't see someone resembling this guy, type two. See, this guy right here, this character was in the movie of the book of Clarence. See, what was interesting in this movie, right? As the movie got to a certain point, he was he was a bum. He was a uh, a, a beggar all throughout the movie. He came in contact of the with the true Messiah and the true Messiah healed him. And make a long story short, he cleaned himself up. He took the Messiah blessed so that money was coming out of his hands. And guess what? He took all those resources. He went and got himself a makeover. And when he came out, he went from looking like a, 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 a bum, unclean, face dirty, hair all over the place, to looking just like what you see on the screen. Of course, his beard was fuller and his hair was longer. Right. And as he came out, guess what? Our people were like worshiping him like he looked like the Messiah. They were chasing behind him. They were starstruck. Doesn't that sound like our people today? That we've been hacked to accept. We don't feel no danger. We feel no threat. Of that image that you have on your screen, the spirit of Caesar Borgia, the spirit of Serapis. We don't we don't have a fear over this guy we don't have a phobia over this guy but those traumatic experiences that our ancestors had to endure that was handed down to many of us guess what if anything that any person that are portraying a messiah outside of this they ready to attack and throw out the blasphemy word did daniel see a messiah that looked like this or did he see the the person that he saw 
Did he look like this? Daniel did not see this Messiah that you see on the screen. He did not see someone in the image of this person that's on the screen. Let me say that again. Daniel did not see, right, the image of this person on the screen. I want to make that clear. I want to make that clear. And we're going to we're going to break this down in a second. So good things happen on the Shabbat. I want to reiterate the Shabbat. Good things happen on the Shabbat. Great signs occurred on the Shabbat. Right. Great signs are revealed on the Shabbat. So what day did the Messiah reveal himself to John? According to the book of Revelation. What day did the Messiah reveal himself to John? In the book of Revelation. Well, I'm glad you guys asked. I'm going to answer for you. Revelation chapter one, starting at verse nine. Notice what it says. I, Yahweh Kanan, right? That's the Hebrew name for John, the ancient Hebrew, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Yahweh Shai, Right or Yahweh Shah, however you want to pronounce it, Mashayak, Jesus the Christ, was in the isle that that is called Patmos for the word of Yahweh and for the testimony of Yahweh Shai, Hamashayak, Jesus the Christ. I was in the spirit on the Adonai's day or on Adonai's day. Some of you guys would say Adonai, but Adonai day on his day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. See, Christianity have taught us that the Lord's Day, right, is supposed to be now, according to them, the Shabbat. Because the Messiah supposedly was raised from the dead on the Shabbat. Family, that's an absolute lie. In the words of my grandmother, well, she would say the devil is a liar. The Most High's day, the Father's day has always been the Shabbat. From the very beginning. Right. So on this Shabbat is when John. Right. Received the revelation from the Most High. Right. The Hebrew word for revelation or reveal is Gala. This is where you get the word Gala. It means reveal. That's the fifth letter of the Hebrew Alabayat. It means reveal. And the pictograph is uh, a man with his hands lifted up. All right. So I want to make sure you guys understand that. So John received this revelation on the Shabbat. And this is why one of the reasons I believe, because you get these so-called scholars trying to question, many of them question the book of Revelation. Because they'll say that the book of Revelation was written in the Greek, whoever wrote the book of Revelation, uh, their Greek was poor. The, the Greek was really bad. So well, this is not like the some of the other transliterations. Truth be told, guess what? None of the testimonies that, that you see, like Matthew, Mark, those were not written in Greek originally. If you go back and look at the so-called church fathers, starting with Eusebius, the historian, he makes it clear that the original writings of the disciples were in the Hebrew language. The, the, the disciples were not astute in writing Greek. So they would try to come up with arguments, but I can see why. Why? Because number one, when you read the book of Revelation, it continues to show you who the Messiah is, how he looks. And guess what? That the law, statutes and commandments is prevalent. And that guess what? Israel is not forgotten. Israel is not uh, a spiritual Israel. It's a physical Israel. See, the Shabbat is a sign. It is proof. It is evidence. And you can read uh, uh, Exodus chapter 34 and it'll tell you that the Shabbat is a sign forever between Yah and his people. 
See, they don't want to tell you that. They want they don't want to tell you that. They want to give you the impression that, you know, uh, matter of fact, I, I'm not even gonna go there. I want to for the sake of time. All right. So I want you guys to understand this family. You know, the Greek text is not the original manuscripts. When you start understanding the Peshitta, which is the Aramaic writing of the text, and when you study the history of it, the Aramaic history of the text, right, the Peshitta is written not from any of the Greek manuscripts, is written directly from Hebrew. So that you can just use the Peshitta to debunk anyone that don't that, that, that want to denounce the renewed covenant. Many would call the New Testament because they'll say, oh, the Greeks wrote it. No, they didn't. Be, because it's written in Greek. They'll say, oh, yeah, the Greeks wrote. No, if you don't want to deal with the, the Greek translations, use the Peshitta. Aramaic is what? A dialect of Hebrew. OK, that's a whole nother conversation. All right, but let's go ahead and continue, family. So what did the Messiah reveal to John on the Shabbat? What did he reveal to him on the Shabbat? Well, on the Shabbat, the Messiah revealed to John that he is the sign, the proof, and the evidence. Wait a minute. Let me say that again. On the Shabbat, the Messiah proved that he is the sign, the proof, and the evidence. Let me go ahead and put this in here. I wasn't going to do it, but I like to make sure that I give you visuals. I don't like to just say something and not post it. Um, let me put the scriptures here. So that way you guys can see for yourself what the Shabbat is. Let me see. All right, let me put that in here real quick. I want to make sure you guys understand what the Shabbat is. I mentioned the scripture, Exodus chapter uh, 30, uh, 34, but I want to put it up on here and read it real quick because that's important for you guys to understand. Like my grandmother said, the devil is a liar. Let me bring it up here real quick. That's right. The devil is a liar. These people are liars. Anyone that tells you that the Shabbat is not important, they are lying to you. Let me see here. Let me just do a search in this presentation. I'll copy over it. All right. Let me go to the next one. Bear with me one second, family. I'm just copying something over. Wait a minute. Where is it? Where is it? All right. Actually, it's Exodus chapter 31. My, my apologies. All right. Let me bring that over. I thought it was Exodus chapter 34, but it's Exodus chapter 31. And I'm going to copy this over so you guys can see it all right let me do something real quick all right i'm just minimizing a couple of things all right you know what i might as well leave it all in i was going to chop it down ain't no need of me doing that i want to put the entire passage over i'm doing it right now let me copy this over before we uh continue here so I want to make sure you guys understand what the Shabbat is. Let me bring it in here. Bear with me one second. And then we're going to go ahead and break down something here. All right. Let me put it right here. All right. Let's change this here. All right, and let me fix this slide real quick. And you guys should be able to see it here. I want to make sure you guys understand and give you scripture. So I said uh, Exodus 31, I mean 34, but actually it's Exodus 31. So let's go here. Let's go to Exodus 31, starting at verse 13, right? 
speak thou unto the children of Israel. So the Most High is telling Moses to speak to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Shabbat ye shall keep, for it is a sign, Awath, in the Israeli oath, it is a sign between me and you. And we see Awath, the root is actually Ath, right? And many of the texts, right? You ancient texts, you'll see Ath. You'll just see the Alap and the Tha. But for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am Yahweh that doeth sanctify thee. Now, notice what you see here it says, my Shabbat, right? This it says, you shall keep, right? Shamar also transliterates to command. So you'll see in the beginning, right? You'll see Waya Amar, right? You'll see that in the ancient Hebrew for each day of creation. So your translation may say, and God said, transliterates to God said, actually, Waya Amar, in other words, Allah commanded, right? Commanded things to, uh, through his word, for things to form and cre um, come together on each day of creation. In chapter two, it's more, it gives you more of a, a clearer understanding of the creation process that it was actually Yahweh Alahayim that breathed the breath in, of life into Adam, right? But anyway, so you see here, right? The Shabbat, you shall keep, for it is a sign. Make a note of that. Circle this in your scripture. I mean, your, um, your Bible, if you're using an actual Bible or if you are, uh, using an electronic device bookmark this text right for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that i am yahweh that doeth sanctify you ye shall keep the shabbat therefore and the shabbat is not just the uh the seventh day shabbat this is also the feast day Anyone that try to tell you that you cannot honor the feast days in a foreign territory, that is like my grandmother would say, the devil is a liar, right? Because Israel, right, they honored the Passover while they was in Egypt. They honored the feast day of the tabernacles, right? They was asking Pharaoh permission to allow them to go honor feast days, but he wouldn't let them go. Look it up. You see that, I believe, in Exodus chapter 5. There was, they was asking to go into the desert a three days journey to honor feast day. But Pharaoh would not let them go. So what feast they were, they were going to honor in the desert? That would have been the Feast of Tabernacles. So Israel was in Egypt. The Passover, the very first Passover was in Egypt. The Feast of Dedication was even before Egypt, but they were in Egypt trying to celebrate and honor it. Then they were in the desert for almost four years. So Israel spent their first almost 40 feast days in the desert. And Passover in Scripture, guess what? It's celebrated for the most part at your home. So I want to make sure you guys understand this. So ye shall keep the Shabbat. Therefore, it is holy unto you. Don't worry about all what the other nations are doing. It's holy to you, Israel, because the Most High gave it to you. He gave it to our ancestors, regardless of what other people are saying. Stop trying to follow by behind the Catholic Christian doctrine that's profaning. That is the true blasphemy of the uh, of the word of the most high, his commandments. Ye shall keep the Shabbat. It didn't say you, this is something to think about. You shall keep and keep from a Hebraic school of thought. Shamar actually means execute. You shall execute the Shabbat. Therefore, it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall, it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work there, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. In six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Shabbat rest. So that's why you see, again, the signs. Shabbat is a sign. So we see John getting this revelation from Christ on what? The Shabbat. Holy to Yahweh, whosoever doeth any work in the Shabbat day, he shall surely be put to death, Right? Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat 
to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It's perpetual family. I will am is the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew word and it's synonymous to forever. Right? Verse 17, it is a sign between who? Me, between me and the children of Israel. So me, Yahweh, means he exists. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Yahweh made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So taking us all, about, all the way back to what? The first week of creation. All right. So let, Revelation chapter one, going to verse eight. Right. This is key because we dealt with the Shabbat being a sign. Now, when we go to verse eight and it says, I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, saith Adonai, yours to say the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come the almighty. Right. So I am the Alpha and Omega. Now, we have to understand, does this scripture. Is the scripture saying that the father have a beginning? Is the scripture saying that the Messiah has a beginning? Does the father have an ending? Does the Messiah have an ending? Does the father have a starting point to his existence? Does the father have an ending point to his existence? Right. So what does the text actually mean? Because, family, if you say that the father has a beginning point, then there's a limit to him. If you say that the Messiah has a beginning point, a starting point, then there's a limit to him. See, in Judaism, Judaism, they teach that their deity created. Yah. Hawa. Their deity is called Einsof, whom they refer to as the, the infinite one. See, that's what the Kabbalah teach. They teach this so-called God before God is the one that created Yahweh. Peep this out. You guys remember this? This is how the Zohar interprets the opening words of Genesis. The Hebrew is Bereshit bara Elohim, which we usually translate in the beginning, God created. But the Zohar insists on reading the words in the precise order in which they appear in Hebrew. Bereshit, in the beginning, bara it created, Elohim, God. In the beginning, it created God. The Zohar takes that to mean, in the beginning, infinity created God. Now, what could that possibly mean? God is now the object of the verse, not the subject, which sounds impossible or heretical. But the Zohar, I think, is saying that infinity is the true reality of God. Anything else that we call God is puny compared to that. That's our own imagination or our own, our own estimate of what God could be. Ah! Stranger danger! Stranger danger! Stranger danger! Stranger danger! So this is why we have to be careful, family. He said it created God. The infinity created God. I don't even like using that term God. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we progress here he's saying infinity created yah which is the ein soft see family don't get caught up when people uh can you know sound educated in the doctrine that they created see it's easy to sound educated and you it's easy to create institutions based upon what you think, what you want, and what you believe, right? Or hear, and then try to solidify it by saying, hey, we have an institution. Come on, family. Truth be told, anybody can start an a, a institution, start a school, 
you know, you could start a school called Funky Fingers, <laughs> Funky Finger Miss, uh, Ministry. Whatever you want to create. And then you can come up with a an overall foundational teachings for that Funky Finger University. And get people degreed up. In other words, they become agents of your university and your doctrine. Having a BS, <laughs> right? Go figure the acronyms, right? And what? Funky Fingers Production. Come on, family. It's, it's just that easy. That's what that's what many of these people have done. They created institutions for themselves, for their doctrine. And guess what? They pumped themselves on the chest to saying, you know what? You know, we have a degree behind our doctrine to prove or give it validity per se. Anyway, what does the text actually mean, family? This quote is actually referring to signs, right? The Messiah is the sign. He is the proof. He is the evidence sent directly from the Father. And all signs come from the Father. Right? The resurrection was not on the, sh the first day of the week. It was not on a Sunday. It was on the seventh day. That's a fact. That's a fact. You, I'm still trying to figure out how they can have Good Friday and then say that Christ rose early Sunday morning. It, the math doesn't add up. You can't have Pentecost Sunday, right? And have a service on Sunday saying that that was the same day that he rose. NASA, we got a problem. The math doesn't add up, right? Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that, but we know. That the Shabbat is a sign. So the Messiah being resurrected, being raised from the dead on the Shabbat, that further proves and cements that, guess what? That uh, the Shabbat is a sign. It is proof and it is evidence, not for the non-blood descendants of Israel. It's for the Israelites to restore salvation to them now those that are sons of strangers that are non-blood descendants of israelites of israel rather right if they want to have a relationship with the father they got to embrace the covenant and honor shabbat you cannot say that you want to only follow christ and you disregard the commandments because christ made it clear he did not come with a new doctrine he is what teaching the father's doctrine in John chapter seven he said the doctrine I teach is not of my own, but it's the one that sent me. The Messiah is the sign proof evidence sent directly from the father and all signs come from the father. Right. Here's the Hebrew dictionary definition of sign. Right. The Hebrew word, as you see here, ath or atha. All right. But let's see what this means. Let's see what ath means. It says here. A signal, evidence, mark, miracle, proof. That's what it means. Circle evidence, circle proof, or write it down. Family, encourage yourself. Stop chasing miracles. You are the miracle. Too many of us have been programmed to chasing miracles. Asking the most high. Yeah, I need a miracle. Do you know every time you look at yourself in the miracle, I mean, mirror, you see a miracle? Do you know you're not supposed to know that you are Israelites? Do you not know that you're not supposed to know that you are Yah's chosen people? Do you know that you're not supposed to be here in this awakening, understanding what you understand? See, guess what? If you're looking for a miracle right now, that tells me that you don't understand your heritage. You don't understand your identity. You are the miracle. Guess what? The, 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 the hair texture, your skin complexion, the whole not you are the miracle and that's not being idol uh, operating in idolatry because the most high use your 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 skin complexion as signs proof and evidence he used the messiah's hair texture this the text i mean the uh the texture and tone of his skin right to show you that his signs is proof it is evidence come on family 
Moses was given two signs because the Israelites, all they knew the father was by a literal, literal name, but they didn't know the reputation behind it. All they knew was the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian captivity. And that's why Israel began to take on many of those strongholds. That's all they knew. And Moses said, yeah, these Negroes need a sign. The first sign that the most high gave him was what? His staff. He said to him, what is that in your hand? Do you know the most high has already given you the proof, the evidence that he exists? It's in your hand. All you have to do is look in the mirror. That staff represents Moses' identity because every shepherd had a staff that was customized to them. They had their staff, they had their bracelets, and they had their signet ring. So the first uh, 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 sign that the Most High gave to Moses was his identification. But see, many of you don't understand the, the, the seriousness of this. Why? Like Judah, Judah identification was his ring, was his bracelets, was his staff. And what did he do? He decided that he wanted to go to Las Vegas. He decided because of the, the saying that's going around, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So he decided to go out there with his buddy, his rolling partner. And he decided to get into some, some mischief. He decided that he wanted to get laid. He wanted to, he decided that his flesh, uh, he couldn't sub, uh, subject his flesh. So he decided he went to to Vegas because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But he didn't know that what he was going to encounter was going to change his entire life. After he done, uh, uh, did what he did with what he thought was a prostitute and what happened? He didn't have the money to pay up. So what happened? That prostitute told him, hey, you know, you're going to have to give me collateral. You're going to have to give me something that I know that you're going to come back and give me what you owe me. So what did Judah did? Judah, he gave up his signet ring. He gave up everything that identified him for a moment of pleasure. But Judah didn't know that the severity of what he had done. Doesn't that sound like our, us here? Right. So what ended up happening? It turned out that it was Tamar, his daughter in law. Didn't even know she dressed up. She looked up. She looked completely different. But because he was so uh, uh, pressed with his flesh, he didn't stop to find out who this person was. He just wanted to what? Get him a jump off. Come on, fam. I'm just making it plain. He just wanted a jump off. But he thought whatever happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas. So here it is. He finds out that his daughter-in-law that's supposed to have been designated to his son, right? His daughter-in-law is pregnant. And guess what? Now he wants to call her out. But little did he know that there was somebody recording. Somebody had their phone ready. Somebody had their watch ready. Somebody had their tablet ready. Didn't know that somebody was live streaming what happened. Tamar had him had him pegged, had him all mapped out. And guess what? When he called himself trying to call out Tamar, tried to uh, disgrace her in front of the people, what happened? Tamar said, guess what? Bam, here's your identity that you're looking for. Where did I get it from? And guess what? Judah had to repent. Come on, family. Identity is everything. And many of us don't understand how 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 serious and how real and how important is our identity. Do you know that judgment day is going to be Christ? Going to see if he can what? ID you? See if he can identify you? Come on, family. We got to be real about it. But see, identity, that staff is part of Moses' identity, right? Because even David, when David went to go fight uh, Saul's giant, Saul went to give him armor that did not belong to him. And David is like, wait a minute, Saul, this stuff just don't feel right. This, this stuff is too heavy. See, family, the reason why many of us are dealing with strongholds is because Christianity, Catholicism, and Judaism placed an identity on us that is what? Called causing all kinds of problems within our community. So they expect us to go out here and slay their giants. But guess what? They want us to wear their identity. See, Saul wanted King David, or should I say David at the time, the young David, to wear an identity, to wear armor that he was not familiar with. David said, this is a weight. This is a stronghold. You know what? I need to use what the most high protected me with when I was doing my chores. So what did David do? He went and got his shepherd's bag. He got on five smooth stones. He got a sling. He got everything that identified who he is. So if anyone try to tell you that identity doesn't matter and the words of my grandmother, the devil is a liar because the most high gave Moses and reminded 
reminded him that his identity was right there in his hand and use that as a sign, use it as proof, use it as evidence so that way the people know that Yah is real. But he didn't stop there. He said, Moses, you know what? I'm going to do you. I'm going I'm to do you even better. You know what? I'm going to give you something even better that's going to that that's going to tie into that if they don't believe the first sign he said i got to give you another witness that's deuteronomy chapter 17 and deuteronomy chapter 19 guess what in the mouth and two or three witnesses in the mouth of two or three witnesses that's in order for something to be established so guess what the most i said i can't leave you hanging i got to give you another sign so what did he do he said moses guess what take your hand put it inside your cloak what did he do he used the skin complexion as a sign he used this dark-skinned negro use his skin complexion as a sign because he knew the dark-skinned Negroes, the dark-skinned Negro Israelites was going to see his hand go from dark melanated to what? Non-melanated, no pigmentation in it. He went from having this nice chocolate skin to having what? Albino, albinism. So he knew that when the people saw that, they want to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, Yah is real. If you can make a leper change his skin, if you can make a Negro change his skin to like the come on, family, the devil is a lie when people trying to teach contrary. So guess what? Anyone that want to come at you about the skin doctrine, guess what? Tell them to go to the father because the father created skin doctrine. Guess what? That's what the laws of leprosy for. So guess what? Anyone that's trying to tell you that uh, Noah was an albino, guess what? The devil is a liar because guess what? Albinism is leprosy, a form of leprosy. No pigmentation is not natural. So Noah did not have leprosy. The devil is a liar. Come on, family. Come on, family. Come on, family. What's that in your hand? It's your identity. Look on the backside. Give me five on the backhand side, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. My dad used to do that all the time. That's that old school, you dig? That's just, that's their dialogue. That's how they talk. That's how they communicate it. So when you look at it on the backhand side, or they would say the black hand side, guess what? Look at your black hand side and tell me what you see. That is your sign. That is your proof. That is your evidence that guess what? Y'all looks like you. The Messiah looks just like you. Come on, family. Come on, family. The devil is a liar. And guess what he told Moses? He said, if they don't believe that second sign, if they don't believe that skin complexion, the signs of your skin complexion, guess what? Now he's going to go ahead to what? Curse the land. See, that's why you're seeing all these different plagues. You see all of these things now starting to raise up because Israel is starting to wake up. Israel is starting to cry out like uh, Matthew chapter 24 says after the great tribulation, there's going to be a cry among the Israelites. And guess what? There's a cry right now that's happening. Then we're going to start seeing the signs of his return. See, the devil is a lie. They don't want us to understand that. So every one of you guys that every last one of you guys that are watching. If you're looking for a sign, you don't have to look far. What's that in your hand? Turn your hand over to that black hand side and you can get your signs. You can give your get your proof. You can get your evidence that Yah is real. His son is real. Yahweh Shai Ha Mashiach is real. Come on, family. Come on, family. So a sign is distinctive. And uniquely recognized. Let me say that again. A sign is distinctive and uniquely recognized. Come on, family. So the signs right off were given to Moses, Masha, directly from the father. Right. So let's give clarity to this. So Moses was given signs from Yahweh to show and prove his authority to Israel had never who had never experienced his power. Israel was in bondage. All they knew was the Egyptian authority family. So when we understand Alpha and Omega, right, that is an, a Greek way of looking at the text. That's not, the, 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 the Messiah did not say to John, he is the Alpha and Omega. He would have used these two Hebrew letters here, the Ah and the Tha. The pronunciation of the first letter here is the Alap, the last letter is the tha, right? But in the Israeli language, this letter is silent. Shh, it makes no sound. So you're only pronouncing what? The mark of man. 
wait a minute. And we talk about the mark of the beast. What is the 666? It is the system of man. So guess what? When you pronounce and you say an Elohim, guess what? You are pronouncing a name that is made and created from the mark of man. Allah Hayam is the proper name for when you instead of saying eh. Elohim. Guess what? That's why you hear in Arabic, they, uh, they say Allah, or uh, uh, well, Allahim, right? And Aramaic is Allah. You have two Shemitic languages that are dialects, sister dialects of Hebrew saying Allah as the root word. So where do we get Elo? Eloha. That makes absolutely no sense. The devil is a liar. Come on, family. Christ warned about it in Matthew chapter five. He said, not one jot, jot, that's the, uh, in the Greek is the eighth letter, but in the Hebrew is the 10th letter, yod, which means outstretched arms. He said, not one jot or one tittle, tittle, right? Kur, kuras, which comes from the root kur, right? Which actually means hair. He said, don't you even touch the hairs of the letters and the ancient Hebrew letters look like they have hairs, not this Israeli block letter stuff you see today. So the key letters to the Hebrew word for signs, Ath, let's break it down. I just gave it to you, right? You have the Alap, which means leader, strength, power. Then you have the Tha, which means signs, mark, evidence, right? So together, this is the first letter, the last letter. Christ did not say, excuse me, nor did the father say that he was alpha and omega. Mm -mm. See, I know we've been caught up in that song. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He is alpha and omega. Come on, family. Have you? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, you, you, you the, the, um, the, the uh, older uh, people that grew up in church. Come on, family. How many of you got? You guys know what I'm talking about. Isn't that not a song? Do y'all remember singing those songs? No, nah, he's not Alpha. He is the Alap and the Tha. And the Israeli is the Aleph and the Tav. Right. But in ancient Hebrew, it's actually the Allah and the Thah. See, we've been brainwashed, singing songs. Right. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what Nebuchadnezzar used to get the people to singing and doing what he wanted them to do to worshiping those idols? Blessed Trinity. Right. All those different songs. He is Alpha and Omega. Come on, family. Nah. Yahweh is not Alpha and Omega. He has no beginning. He has no ending. Now, what he actually means, right? As you see these two letters here together, right? The Tha, sign, mark, evidence, leader, strength, power. Together, this formed the word Ath, right? Sign in Hebrew, which means evidence. It means proof. All right. So when you start manipulating, manipulating these letters, like silencing the very first letter, the Allah and silencing the ion, those are two key letters. You silence those letters. You're changing what salvation is. So silence, silence, silencing the ah will allow the changing of what the associated signs when they start changing these signs or changing these words now they start what little by little eroding at your identity and pushing doctrines that's not of the father right those dots that you see on those that so-called hebrew language which is actually israeli language guess what that's a ninth century creation that's for them to remember their accents of how they superimpose their pronunciation of the words on it. Anyway, so who are the signs for? Who are they created for? Notice that you see here, atha. If you add the ha at the end, right? You say atha ha or atha with the ha at the end. 
Now, guess what? Let's see what it means. Let's see what it means. Right? Atha, as you see here, it says Atha. That's getting, dealing with the Israeli. And as you see here, this Alap is silent. So I am not pronouncing this letter here. Right? I'm pronouncing the Patak. I'm pronouncing the Kamets. So Atha. Instead of saying Tha, which this is supposed to make a TH A sound, now I'm sounding like the Israeli, Ata. But nevertheless, still the principle is here. It means thou, thee, and the plural, ye, and you. So guess what? The sign, the ah and the tha, right? That's the sign, the Hebrew word for sign. You add the ha at the end. Now you see that it's meaning that these signs are for who? You, Israel. It's for you, Judah. When we add that, now we're making sure that it's us. All right. All right. I'm giving you guys a little Hebrew 101 here. So the signs were created for you, Israel. There's something special about you, Judah. The signs were created for each and every one of us. See, they know this. They know they can't sing like we sing. They know they can't dance like we dance. They know that they can't worship like us. They can't, They know they can't even preach the word like us. Why? Because it was not given to them. It was given to Judah. It was given to Israel. It was given to all of Israel. There's something special about you, Judah. That's why we, when we, when we look up the word gospel, there's a, a special entry there for us. They know that there's something special about us. So the signs were created for you, Judah, for you, Israel. So what is the significance of the signs given to John, which connects to the vision Daniel saw? Like Daniel and John's revelation includes the physical appearance of the Messiah. So when we go to Revelation chapter one, uh, verse 14, go back here. See, so he understood this. Look at here. It says his head. And his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet unto fine brass, as if they burnt in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Doesn't it sound familiar? Connected to Daniel, right? All right. So let's see what this word like me, just so that way we a simple word, but let's make sure we're on the same page, like having the same characteristics or qualities. That's what like means having the same characteristics or qualities. All right. So his head and hairs were white like wool, did not say it was wool, but it says white like wool. But guess what? They know when I say they, our oppressors know that there's something special about us because they used our hair for pillows. They used our skin for leather. Come on, family. You can look it up. And I did a teaching on that. They know that there was there's something special about us. Even some of those those sick oppressors literally put in their writings saying that there's no better leather, leather than the skin of a Negro. So that's the best and the strongest leather, stronger than the horse leather, stronger than elephant leather, stronger than cow leather. And guess what? They were making oil out of our skin. They were making, uh, uh, like I said, coats and shoes and belts out of our skin. They were eating our skin. Guess what? They were even doing just like how you, uh, 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 like they dry out the skin and they'll use it. And um, I can't remember what they call it, you know, uh, the type of meat that they let it dry, let dry out. But they were doing that with our skin. There was just like how they had chicken feet. They was eating Negro ears, just like they were eating chicken feet. They were also they were making uh, uh, designs out of it as well. That's right. Jerk. They was making jerk Negroes. All right. So his head and hairs were white like wool. All right. So like remember means having the same characteristics or qualities. So when we go to hair, look at what it says about hair. Threeks is the Greek, the Greek word, but that doesn't really give you the mo um, the true understanding of it. So it tells us to go to this Greek word, karyon, right? Tells us it's comparable to this Greek word. So let's see what, I'm mean, not karyon, kome, I said karyon, that's the, now I'm getting into um, the 
uh, the letters, right? I mean, the um, tittle, my apologies, all right? So we see Kome, right? So Threeks is comparable with Kome. And when we break down Kome, let's see what Kome means. It says here, the hair of the head. But do you guys see this right here? Let me go to the background so no one could try to accuse me of manipulating anything. Do you guys see this word right here? I put the mouse up under it. Right? Do you guys see it? It says locks. Wait a minute, Pastor. You're saying that locks? That's right, family. Locks were popular among Israel. You'll see it all through the Levitical priests. When you read Numbers chapter 6, the Nazarite vows, you'll see locks mentioned here. You'll see uh, Samson had locks. You'll see uh, Samuel, if you study Samuel, Ezekiel had locks. Because the Most High pulled him by what? The lock of his hair. And even talks about how long your locks should grow. Come on, newsflash, man. Your locks is not supposed to be halfway down your back. Read Daniel. I mean, read Ezekiel. Your locks is not supposed to be that long. If you weren't locks, according to uh, reading Ezekiel, your locks is not supposed to be that long. So if locks is all through Israel, guess what? The Messiah had locks. This was a lifelong walk with him. You know, so locks. I'm talking about Negro locks. Not the stuff you see other communities are doing. No, his hair, they, they can't get the locks like us. There's something special about you, Judah. All right. So I want to make sure you guys understand locks were popular among Israel. So as we see here, the Messiah had locks, right? So Kome means the hair of the head. It means locks. So now I want to make sure you understand, right? I didn't go into Solomon. This is, uh, I didn't get there yet, but we'll get there. Solomon's locks are like a mound, a pile of hair, falal, all right? But I want y'all to see this display here, right? Now, tell me if this looks like your hair. If this looks like your hair, type one. If this looks like your hair, type one. If this looks like Negro hair, type one. Type one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a video here that, that's going to confirm this here. These are wigs, Egyptian wigs. In the British Museum, you know, uh, that most have no clue exists. I think I have it here. I hope I still have it up. If not, I may have to upload it. Let me see if I can upload it real quick. I may be able to do it. Let's see. Because I have my hard drive connected. Uh, I think it may be here. Oh, come on. I may not, family. It's not co cooperate. All right, let's see. All right, let's see if I can get it. Uh, wigs. Nope. Let me try it elsewhere. Let me try one more place. If not, we'll just not waste a lot of time trying to find it. Oh, I think I found it.
All right, so while that is uploading, let's see some of the comments. All right, so far, looks like uh, you guys are have voted, and it looks like you guys are, let's see here. Let's see, Mason, Masonama, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, charge it to my head, not to my heart. My apologies. Say one. It's uh, Hebrew new. One. Ama say one. Your family list uh, gives show some love for our elder here. All right. Simo one. Linda J one. Michael Riddick one. Jasmine Kirkwood. All right. Matter of fact, I see some shout outs here. I want to say thank you for the love and support. Family, let's give uh, some love, show some love for generation love. Thank you for the contribution. Really appreciate it, my brother. And Ama uh, Bithya Batya Yisrael. Let's let's uh, uh, show some love. Oh, Bithia, excuse me if I, if I, you know, mom, I, I'll be butchering names here, right? But let's show some um, some love to our elder that's in the building. Thank you for the love tonight. Really appreciate it, family. And let's show some love. She's holding down uh, California. And, um, you know, she's been uh, really showing a lot of love and support for We Woke Now. And, um, I'm, uh, shoot me an email offline. I'm, I want to see if we can get you out here this year. Uh, we fly you out here to one of our feast days, maybe even the Passover. So reach out to me. Shoot me an email offline. We'd we'll definitely like to get you out here. So thank you for the love and support. And I also see Crowder. Thank you for the super sticker. Real, really appreciate the love and support. Family, let's show some love for C. Crowder. Appreciate it Barbar, um, um, for, for the love and support. All right. So, so far, looks like everyone say one. Lisa, Sister Lisa, one. Sister Carol said one. All right. So let me give you a uh, something that you, you can view. Right. Something that's tangible. Right. That's actually in the British Museum. Let me play this real quick. All right, family. Now, doesn't that look like this? these images that you see here? Doesn't that look like these images that you see here? Come on, family. Doesn't that look like this? Doesn't this hair look just like our hair, just like the images that I shared? Right? This is, this is the, what they won't tell you. But guess what, family? Head and his hair were like wool. Let's bring this image back up. What you see here, this is a superimposed image. I made it black. I reversed it, right? So that way it's black and white. And you cannot tell that this is actually sheep hair until I reverse it back to its original appearance. See, they know, <laughs> they know that we are the people of the book. 
They know as they that hair that you see up in the um, British Museum, they know that this is our hair. This is our hair texture. They know that we were scattered all through Egypt, just like the scripture says. It says the Israelites were scattered all through Israel. This is our hair. Our hair is like this. In other words, have the same characteristics. All right. So let's go to Song of Solomon, chapter five, starting at verse 11. Right. And let's see what it says. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks. Right. Uh, it says, Kwawat is uh, Wath or Kwawat's Wath, right? Plural, are bushy, thal, lathal, yam, and black, shakar, as a raven. So now we have to get clarity here. It says his locks are bushy. Come on, family. Let's give proper clarity to this bushiness of his locks, right? His locks, right, are, are bushy. Let's go to the Hebrew dictionary definition of bushy. As you see here, it doesn't give you much. It just says a trailing bow, a bow, bushy, uh, wavy. But the key is branchy, though. That gives you a little something, branchy. branchy. So it's a bush, but it's what? Branchy. Come on, family. That's the key right here, branchy. When our hair lock, does it look like a, a, a bush of branches? Come on, family. When our hairs are locked, doesn't it look like a pile of bushes? It looks like a pile of branches, right? So the primitive root definition of, uh, of uh, for locks, it says mound, to pile up, right? Falal. But again, branches. Our hair looks like a pile of branches. It looks like roots, as um, uh, Nora Bain uh, pointed out. So Solomon had locks, our locks, like how our hair locks. Not what those other cultures try to do to make their hair uh, form whatever locks that they want to form, plaits. All right. Branchy. All right, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 15. And his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. All right, and notice what I read from. Again, this is Revelation chapter uh, 1 verse 15. Uh, man, I thought I put it in here. Revelation chapter 2 also verse 18 says the same thing. I thought I put it in here. Um, did, let me see if I did. Nope, I didn't put it in here. So you see his description, his, the Messiah's description in Revelation twice, at least two times, right? This tells you that this is what? Signs, two or three witnesses. So this is reiterating his skin complexion, just like with Moses, right? Mo this was the second sign that was given to Moses, but the most high mention this i mean christ mentions this twice on a shabbat to john we are going to use king solomon again uh to explain the complexion of the messiah just why just like we use this hair let's use this complexion song of solomon chapter 5 verse 10 now we're going to give clarity to here my beloved is white and ruddy the chief is among ten thousand. so it says here my beloved is white Tazak or Tzak or Tazak Ka, however you want to pronounce it, but Tazak, right? This is not the skin texture that's being described because when you leave it up to Christianity, when you leave it up to Catholicism, when you leave it up to Judaism, they'll make you think that the Messiah looks like this guy here in the corner. They'll make you think that this is the image, right? In other words, the signs to prove the evidence that this is how the messiah looked no the messiah didn't look like this nor was the messiah an arab looking or middle eastern looking or mediterranean looking these are constructs and descriptors that are what uh about a hundred years 
So this is not the skin texture that's described. Daniel didn't see this. This is what this is not the person that was hung on the cross. This is not the person that was resurrected on the Shabbat. This is not the person that is revealing himself to John. This is not that person that is described that Daniel is describing who he saw. So white, this is the Hebrew dictionary definition of white, right? As you see here, this is saying sakak, right? But it says be dazzling, white. Wait a minute, does this mean white? But it says be dazzling. It's not talking about a white race. Let's go to the Oxford Dictionary definition of white. It says here, right? It says blind, of a bright light, blind, temporary, a person temporary. But then when we go to entry, sub entry 1.1, this is the kicker. This is what we really want to highlight. Amaze or overwhelm. In other words, someone with a particular impressive quality. So dazzle means amazing, not white, right? In Hebrew, white tazak means amazing, right? So my beloved is white and ruddy. Actually, it's saying my beloved is what? Amazing. This is referring to his skin complexion. His skin complexion is maze, amazing. But now we got to look at ruddy. What does ruddy mean? And we have the Hebrew, the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew word here, Adama. Oh, wait, excuse me, Adawam. Right now, this is the ancient pronunciation, Adawam for ruddy. Right, I'm not dealing with the Israeli. Right, so when we go to the scriptures, we see Adam or Adom. This is the Israeli pronunciation, Adom. It means rosy, red, ruddy. Right, and we see lentils. Lentils is not. Caucasian looking the color, the texture of true lentils. They are what dark red, really dark red lentils, right? But anyway, Webster Dictionary, unabridged dictionary definition of ruddy. Let's see what Webster say about ruddy. Right? It says here, and we're going to highlight entry number two of a live fleshly color or the color of the human skin in high health. In other words, ruddy is what saying that healthy skin so um, uh, dazzling or amazing white is simply what dazzling or amazing beautiful skin has nothing to do with a redneck has nothing to do with caucasians it has everything to do with a compliment but i'm not going to leave you here because we got to give context here let's go to genesis 25 and 25 notice what it says here and the first came out red out of my one eye right this is the ancient pronunciation of esau's um skin complexion uh in the israeli adam need right but adam i one eye all over like an hairy garment and they called this name aisha right aisha which transliterates to Esau. So was Esau looking like this guy? See, that's poor, part of the poor teachings that many are teaching. And no, family, let's get the red bone. No, we're not going to deal with red bone. Esau was not a red bone because when you say that, you're still tying into the, 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 uh, the, the false narrative. There's nowhere in scripture that says red bone. See, this is what happens when we when, when when others start trying to hijack our identity and they start coming up with these terms esau was not a red bone there's not a single definition that refers to adam adamnai or adamni or adamawanai or ruddy from a biblical term as being light skin or red bone let's not let's let go of these terms esau was not a red bone because now you're saying that he was light skin Let's stop this. Esau, see, we, we when we start creating those terms, those descriptors for one another, oh, this person is light skinned, he's dark skinned. Now you're cre creating a separation. No, Esau was not light skinned. Esau was not a red bone. The scripture just simply says that he was ruddy. Ruddy does not mean he was a red bone. All right. So I want to give clarity. In, uh, in, um, uh, and Nika, I want to apologize. I'm not, uh, if I, if I misunderstood what you were saying, that Esau was a red bone, right? I, I want to apologize if I misunderstood what you're saying. I just go, I'm glancing at the chat. So, I'm, you know, but I'm going to break down what 
Ruddy is. So my apologies, but let's not let's let's leave that alone. Somebody said, what is Redbone? I don't know what Redbone is, but we start using that as a descri descriptor of somebody description of somebody being light skin, a lighter uh, shade of uh, dark melanated skin. But it's still what considered melanated. Right. So I guess when you go all the way down to the bone, I guess the blood or covering the bone, it will be red bone. So <laughs> come on, y'all, Let, let's. You know, these are some of the things that have crippled our community. You know, these different terms. This is why we even have self-hate. You know, anyway, was Esau looking like this guy on the right? I mean, on the left here of this question. Guess what? No, he did not look like him. Now, this is the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia 1915, giving you proper context. I didn't write this. This is 1915. Look at what it says. Ruddy is the form taken by the adjective red when used as a term of praise of the human skin. And this is its use in the Bible. The dark skinned Hebrews found great beauty in a clear complexion. Let me say that again. It says here, ruddy is the form taken by the adjective when used as a term of praise of the human skin. So when you see in the scriptures, right, um, um, dazzling, white uh, or white and dazzling or whatever basically it's a compliment saying that uh that uh solomon's wife is saying to him he has amazing beautiful clear dark melanated skin because it says here this is its use in the what the scriptures the and, and this is saying in the hebrew as well as in the greek the dark skin hebrews didn't say red bone didn't say light skin because guess what we are dark skin come on family out there inside that desert no matter how light your skin is right now if you were out in that desert during this time your skin will be dark from being out in that sun that's just a fact they go out in that sun guess what they had they get all kinds of skin cancer that's why they start learning to cover up and put all kinds of sunscreen because it, the israelis guess what that territory had the highest uh, skin cancer rate in the world, all right? So the dark-skinned Hebrews found great beauty and a clear complexion. Let me say it one more time. The dark-skinned Hebrews found great beauty and a clear complexion. That is a medical term. Come on, family. Come on, family. That is a medical term. So again, the dark skinned Hebrews found great beauty and a clear complexion. So when we look at this word rosy, notice what it says, rosy of healthy complexions. So rose plus the E, right, means what? Healthy complexion. It has cheerful, but it says healthy complexion. So white and ruddy simply means amazing, beautiful, dark skin, right? Tazak. Adamawanai, right? This is the ancient pronunciation of this word, right? Now, of course, I, I put the, not, I'm not even going to get into all that. But anyway, without these connectors here, because with the connectors, it'd be Adamawanai, right? But we're not doing it that way. It's Adamawanai in the ancient pronunciation of this. Tazak or Taza, Taza, yeah, Taza, I can't even say it now. Tazak. Adamawanai, right? So rud, ruddy, tazak, adam, adamwam, but actually adamawanai. So white and ruddy simply means amazing, beautiful skin. So what was the actual texture of the Messiah's skin? Wasn't this? Did he look like this so-called Messiah that the Roman Catholics, Christianity, and Judaism forced on us? Because guess what? We got to stop leaving Judaism out because if Judaism is not recognizing a Negro Messiah, they're forcing this image right here. How are they trying to portray Israel now as being what? Caucasians, being Europeans. No, nah, we, 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 we tossing this out. Did he look like this so-called Messiah that the Roman Catholics, the Christians, as well as Judaism has forced on our people? Guess what? No. So let's go back to Revelation. I did put it here. Revelation chapter two, verse 18. 
right? This is another description in, in Revelation, second witness that's confirming the Messiah's appearance. And unto the angel of the church of Theotira, all right? Uh, it says, write these things, saith the son of Allah, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Guess what? Remember, family, brass didn't exist at that time, right? That's not dealing with brass. We're dealing with copper. We're dealing with uh, bronze, right? So his feet like unto fine brass is actually copper. Nakashat. And let's see what nakashat means. It says this, right? Copper, hence something made of that metal. An example, coin. And we're going to break this down. I'm going to give you an illustration. So brazen, brass, chain, copper, fetter. All right. But we, we have to understand what copper really is right let's see what it says right i'm not gonna get into all this but this is just telling you about what brass is and this right here when you look at the definition of brass this is further pushing the 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 uh the racial aspect of skin complexion for the sake of time i'm just going to fast forward all right let me fast forward here all right So what color, excuse me, is supposed to say, what is the color or what's the color of copper? Excuse the typo. What is the color of copper? What is the original color of the Statue of Liberty? So to get a proper understanding of what copper is, right? Not this brass, because when we think of brass, we think of like the light polished brass. No, polish is not, that's not what it means back in those times, right? So Let's look at copper. Let's see what copper is, the proper color of copper, right? The Statue of Liberty is a great example to prove uh, that copper, man, excuse the typo, the proper color of copper, right? The Statue of Liberty is a great example to prove the color of copper. That's what it's supposed to say. All right. Anyway, this is an article about the truth about the Statue of Liberty. According to Jim Haskins, because many believe and think that the Statue of Liberty was originally black. And that is because I couldn't find the early images. I had it. I don't know what I did with it. Right. With the Statue of Liberty's head looking like a dark melanated person when he initially built it. But according to Dr. Jim Haskins, a prolific black author was stimulated. The idea for the creation of the Statue of Liberty initially was part of the black soldier soldiers played in the ending of black African bondage in the United States. It was created in the mind of the French historian, Edouard de Lubelle, uh, uh, excuse me if I'm butchering the name, uh, chairman of the, uh, I didn't put it all in here, but it goes on to say, it is true that the original face of the statue was dark in color, right? The original face of the Statue of Liberty was dark in color. It's hard to get this article here. I had it somewhere. I can't find it. If you guys could find it, let me know. I've been trying to find it. I, I, I don't know what I did with my screen prints, but if you can find it, I went into the archives. They're making sure you can't find this article, right? However, the material underneath the familiar green finish is copper, which is a dark metal. Due to exposure to the elements, the statue's head turned pitch black, right? Because again, right? The, when you start looking at copper, it's a dark metal. And we look at the old true pennies. Guess what? They're dark. They're not light. Have you guys seen an old penny? An old penny is dark. Right? The old penny is dark. Look, if you got some old pennies, look at some of those old pennies that's in the 19th, um, uh, the 19th or 20th century, like those 1946 pennies. Copper is dark. It's a dark metal and it gets darker, right? So the grain is, is because of the erosion. It is the erosion from that salt that's, you know, that's from the, um, the sea, from the ocean. So, the Statue of Liberty, that's why they many thought that originally the Statue of Liberty was dark, was a, a, a represented the slaves, you know, actually the, the original design of it that they wanted to have over, I believe it was Egypt, was a dark melanated woman. 
All right. But anyway. So Christ's skin complexion is fine bronze that was burned in the furnace. Right. And this is from a church in Italy. This is the Negro image that they have hanging up in the, a church in Italy. Now, does that look like a Caucasian bronze statue? Does that look like a Caucasian bronze statue on your screen? Come on, family. Does that look like a Caucasian person at all? Even the features within it. But it's all right to have this up in overseas in some of these places. It's all right to have this up. But you can't have this up here in, in, in the United States and many of these racist com countries. Right. You can't have this up. You can't have this image. You have this image, man. OK, Corral. This looks nothing like a Caucasian, even the facial expression, even that nose. We know that that's not a Caucasian nose. That looks like us. Come on, family. All right. So copper is a dark metal. So great signs occurred on the Shabbat. We are wrapping this up. This is not the first time the Messiah revealed and put on display his amazing, beautiful skin, dark melanated skin. And see, that's what religion has done. That's what religion in terms of Christianity, Catholicism and Judaism has done. See, they make it seem as if. You cannot have dark melanated skin and have your skin glowing, can't have that glory, can have, uh, you know, when they think of uh, the glory, right, you, you know, you're, you're, you're Christ transfiguring and all of that. They think of white, non family. He was a dark melanated Negro whose skin uh, just literally glue. His skin glued. They, they were able to see the glory on him. They made us believe that dark skin can glitter, can't have a glow to it, can't have a beauty to it. That's why many now of our brothers and sisters, especially over in Africa, is now bleaching their skin. All right. So let's go to Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse one. And after six days, Yahweh Shai, Jesus the Christ, taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, uh, and bring them up, bringeth them up into a high and high mountain apart. So we see here after what six days? After working six days, after doing whatever six days, on the seventh day, Yahweh Shai pulled these three disciples aside. And guess what? He brought them into, as you see, he bring them up into a and high mountain apart and he transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun he was still dark melanated but they see that glow you know like bruce leroy on uh uh what's that um the last dragon show enough rather remember that glow right that glow when um bruce uh was show enough was glowing i know that's a little old school for some of you guys when show enough was glowing he was still dark melanated his hair texture didn't change. He just had the glow. That glow was permeating on him. And Bruce Leroy, he had the yellow grow, glow. Didn't change his skin complexion. That's just giving you an a illustration of what? The glory. See, he didn't turn white. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When you get that glow, you know. That's right. He had that... That, that, that glow, show enough, who's the master, right? The glow, and that's a perfect illustration that you can have the glow and your skin complexion doesn't change. Do your skin complexion change when that sun, bright as it is outside, hit the height of the day? Does it change your skin complexion? No, you still have what? That dark melanated skin. There's something special about you, Judah. Come on, family. 
So and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias taking or excuse me, talking with him. All right. So going back to Daniel, we did all of this to get back to Daniel. There's one key point I want to make. Daniel chapter 10, starting at verse seven and eight uh, and ending at eight. This is what it says. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. And so that they fled to hide themselves. Verse seven, I mean, verse eight. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. So what did Daniel mean when he said, all of his comeliness turned into corruption. Let's see what comeliness means, right? Now, ah, it says pleasant. In other words, suitable, beautiful, befitting. See, Daniel is saying, man, he's fasting. He's, he's weak. Because when you fast, it does take some strength away from, especially when you're pressing with the prayers and all of that. You, you are going to become a little faint physically. And guess what? You, you, you're going to have some rough, some, some rough patches, you know, not just with your natural man, but also what your, your spirit. You, you're going to be weary. You're going to have some weary times and you may not be, be good to be around. Your attitude may not be good to be around. So that's what Daniel was saying, that he went from being pleasant, even in his appearance. To now he's worn out, he's tired. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? You're doing everything that the most high tell you to do. But, man, it's wearing you out dealing with your own people, trying to encourage them, show them that they are the people to book. And not just the, from an identity perspective, but even some of the things that they keep bringing over. Many are bringing over from Christianity, don't want to let go of Christianity. And also many of them are embracing Judaism, putting putting boxes on their head, putting um even trying to uh, express themselves and bringing on some of the, the traditions that the Jewish community created. You know, guess what? Back at that time in the antiquity, they didn't have a prayer shawl. Guess what? That's created by the Jewish community. They weren't wearing fringes, so to speak, four points on each uh, corner of your belt. That's the, what the Ashkenazi Jewish community wore, uh, created. Guess what? They, they wore robes back at that time. They were, Man, these are things that the Ashkenazi Jewish community created. And many of our brothers and sisters are taking on cultures, taking on their interpretations and now making it as if that is actual the truth. It's not. Those prayer cloths or those prayer shawls, they didn't exist back in the biblical times. Come on, family. Come on, family. Those fringes, guess what? It wasn't the fringes we see today. In which David cut the fringe of King Saul. Anyway, reminding him of the law, statutes and commandments, because every king is required, was required to write a copy of the commandments, to write the copy of the laws. So they can't say that no one told them. All right. So now ah means to be pleasant. Because that's dealing with attitudes, right? To be pleasant or suitable, beautiful. All right. So David is described, right? When we start dealing with that word comely, He's described as being comely, in other words, handsome. But he was also described as being dark. Let me prove this, right? Open up your Bible, go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting at verse 12. Notice what it says here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. Remember? Ruddy means dark, beautiful skin. Not a redneck. Not red bone. He was dark. He was dark skinned, and withal of a of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to, 
And Yahweh said, Arise, anoint him, for he is he. Now let's look at some of the other translations. This is the ISV, the International Standard Bible Version, right? He So he sent and brought him. He had a dark, healthy complexion. You can look this up. Look this verse up on Bible Hub, and you'll see the ISV translation describes David as being saying that he had a dark, healthy complexion with beautiful eyes, and he was handsome, right? So that the KJV doesn't show that, but notice what we see here that is saying that David was dark-skinned. Family, they know we the people of the book, right? Let's look at the NHEB Bible, right? This translation, it says, and he was reddish-brown, and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Let's look at another because in the mouth of three, two or three witnesses, this is the NLT Bible. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And Yahweh said, this is the one anoint him. So family, we see with some of these translations, they're telling the truth that David was dark, right? He was dark, melanated with beautiful skin. Say he was handsome. OK, so David was dark and handsome. But what's the key to Daniel's experience as we wrap up? Was David uh, Daniel's experience all about skin complexion? Let me say this again, even though that's a sign. But was his experience all about skin complexion? I'll, I'll put this in the chat as we get ready to wrap up. All right. All right, we're, we're, we're almost um, at 500 likes, thumbs up. Family, really appreciate it. Let's see if we can get us uh, over the 500 mark. So let me put this inside the chat. And I got to figure out how to slow down this chat. I know you can. I got to make sure I slow it down in the future. All right. So let's put a man, that chat is going, man. And I don't, I, I, I'm going to make sure in the future that I start slowing down that chat. All right. Was uh was Daniel All right, let's see here. Was uh the key was the key uh to to uh daniel's experience skin all right was it skin complexion all right that's the wrong one let me get that out of here. I don't want to do a Q&A. I was typing the wrong one. All right, let's do a poll. All right. Let's put the poll here. All right. And um, we're halfway there to 500 thumbs up. So if you haven't, click the like and subscribe uh, to the channel. Uh, click that thumbs up, you know, whether it's thumbs up or thumbs down, it's still, whether you agree or disagree, just hit that thumbs up. Doesn't cost you anything. Hallelujah. All right. So what's the key to Daniel's experience? Skin complexion, right? And I want to say to you guys, that wasn't the key to his experience. All right. But again, Let me explain. Let me explain. Was it simply the skin complexion? I know I shot the shot the um, gun a little too soon, but it's all right. His whole key to this part of his experience of seeing the Messiah was about being made whole. It's about being made whole. Daniel lost all his strength, and he needed to be made whole. He was weak. He needed to be made whole. He needed every aspect of his body to be restored. 
which leads me to this word kaya, right? Let's see what kaya means. It says to live, to revive, to preserve, recover, repair, restore, be whole. See, family, we have to change our prayer lives, right? We have to get beyond uh, being a uh, praying just for one singular thing. Let's just say, you know, you guys want the most high to touch your finances. You may be going through some tough uh, patches in your, you know, uh, in your life right now with finances. So many would just pray, Yah, touch my finances, right? That's the key is being made whole in every aspect of your life, right? In every aspect of your life, right? Not just a portion of your life. See, when the woman touched the fringe or the fringes of the Messiah's garment, he was made whole. She was made whole in every aspect of her life. She exhausted so much resources trying to be healed, but she got her healing by going directly to the Messiah, going directly to the Messiah. So family, uh, when Christ saw that she touched him, right? Of course he asked the question, but he, he encouraged her. He said, your faith, right? Aman, consistency. Aman means consistency. It means trust. It means belief. It means permanent. It means go to the right hand, saying that her faith, her consistency, her uh, uh, trust and being faithful to him and understanding the importance of the right hand made her whole, not just in one aspect of her life, but in her entire life, in including her finances, including her uh, her relationships with family members all around. She was made whole. She was restored. Do you know, family, sometimes you could be feeling a certain way. And guess what? You could burn some bridges. You could be going through this fast and not what? Being pleasant to people. You can um, some some of you may have come into this awakening and start throwing everyone in hell, you know, telling them to go to hell, you know, really rub people a certain way. Right. You can even deal with ailments that can make you what? Have a bad attitude. Be snappy. Right. So, again, what it means here, like when you ask the most high to heal you, if you're dealing with any infirmities, ask the most high to make you whole. Ask the most high that if there's anyone that you hurt anyone that you uh, didn't intend or uh, indirectly hurt because of your attitude, because of how you may have been feeling or your day is going bad or you feeling weary in your well-doing, but the, in the most high lifted you up, guess what? Ask for forgiveness. Yeah, if there's anyone that I said or did or rubbed the wrong way because of my attitude or because of how I am feeling right now, forgive me. Be made whole in every aspect of your life. If you're asking the Father to touch your finances, Yah, forgive me for my poor decision. Touch my finances. Forgive me. Restore the trust that my, uh, uh, and, you know, that my family should have in me. You know, but I let them down because I didn't. I was not responsible financially. You know, finances can affect every aspect of your life. If you don't pay your debt. Come on, family. Come on, family. It's just this simple, family. It is just this simple. Let me do some of my mouse's. It's just this simple. So when Christ Hamashayak said that she was made whole, right? To be made whole is every aspect of your life. You are healed. Hallelujah. So that concludes this lesson. I know it's pretty lengthy, uh, you know, but it is what it is. You know, it's on a, it's a sh Saturday night. Right. So, hey, what better place to be than to be uh, talking the word at this time of the hours? Thank the most high for delivering me and many of you from a lifestyle that had we still been living a certain lifestyle. You know, we'll just be getting going with the things that we were indulging in. So thank the most high for delivering us from those lifestyles. So I really hope and pray that this lesson helps you guys uh, to let you see clearly that Daniel saw 
the Messiah, the Negro Messiah, which Revelation confirmed, because we see that Revelation is a continuation to this prophecy. So he saw the Negro uh, Israelite Messiah. He saw a Negro, not this Caucasian person that you see on your screen. All right. So again, family, uh, really appreciate the love and support. I am getting ready to take it down. But I just want to take some time out and do this teaching for you. Want to at least get a, you know, uh, get a couple of teachings in before the turn of this month. If you haven't hit the like, hit the subscribe to the channel. Uh, let's get those thumbs up. If you haven't hit that thumb, you know, let's get those. Let's see if we can get the numbers uh, up to uh, 100 in terms of the, uh, the likes, because that does uh, continue to help the algorithms. So that way uh, it, it really keeps us uh, in a certain space uh, with the with, with YouTube. All right. In terms of uh, people getting the notifications. All right. So, again, really appreciate you guys, family. And again, tomorrow I will do some editing. I got to go over to the temple and I will do some editing on the lesson that was given at Shabbat. And I tell you, it was it was a powerful service and um, really thank the most high for everything that he continues to do. Really appreciate you guys. All right. So, again, if you haven't hit those thumbs up and if you think that or believe that you already subscribed to the channel, double check to make sure YouTube did not unsubscribe you, which they have done a lot and continue to do a lot. All right. But love you, family. Uh, in the words of the uh oh in the words of yahweh uh in the words of encouragement that he had given to uh noah and not Noah, but moses to give to israel exodus chapter 14 verse 13 and 14 you know these this is the words of encouragement that he gave to moses to give to the people of israel he told them to fear ye not stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. These Egyptians that you see here today would not have strongholds over or would not have strongholds over you ever again, would not have power over you again. The most high will fight for you. But here's the kicker family. We have to hold our peace. The Hebrew word there is karash, which simply means be quiet. Right? So we have to learn how to operate in what is called calculated silence can't go back can't stay here keep moving forward shalom listen genesis chapter 11 verse 10 explains the genealogy of shem shem was a black man in africa if you repeat this back Genesis 14, verse 13. Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham, Isaac was the father. Jacob had 12 sons. For real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10. These were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10.